Hello, and welcome to my channel. I am Damien Marie at Hope. In the simplest terms, I am an atheist humanist philosopher and prehistorical writer researcher at DamienMarieAtHope.com. I am specifically an axiological atheist. An axiological atheism can be thought to involve ethical and value theory reasoned and moral argument driven apathyism, agnosticism, atheism, antitheism, anti-religionism, secularism, and humanism. Axiological atheists can be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. As an axiological atheism's ethically reasoned and constructive pro-humanity. I am an axiological thinker, value theorist. The science of goodness, worthiness, usefulness, valuableness, virtue, reliableness, accuracy, validity, morality, integrity, beneficialness, etc., etc. We axiologists have a value consciousness. And in general, we see the architecture of humanistic humanitarianism value in people that we see as dignity beings. Places and things are not. Axiology is a value theory. In its broadest sense, it involves areas of philosophy that are deemed to encompass some evaluative or evaluation aspect. Therefore, it crosses almost all domains in some way or another. Now for a more detailed terms as to what I am. I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science and am against pseudoscience, pseudo-history, pseudo-morality, things that are found in religion. I support realism, axiology, of course, liberty, justice, ethics. I am also an anarchist socialist. I support Anarchism and Socialism, Progressivism, Liberalism, Philosophy, Psychology, Archaeology, and Anthropology, Advocating for Sexual, Gender, Child, Secular, LBGTQIA+, Race, Class Rights, and Equality. So if you can guess from all that, I support or challenge that I have an eclectic variety of videos on a variety of topics. Please take time to check them out. As well as enjoy, if you enjoy them, please give them a like. And don't forget to subscribe as new things are on their way all the time for my channel. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Um, Hold on. I'm a bit narrow. You're, you're, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> like, we're getting half your face. Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to sit very carefully. Right. Okay. I'll move the mic. Oops. Oh. You were good. I was good. <laughs> uh, Uh-oh. There we go. Yeah, you're back. Chinese technology. <laughs> right on. <laughs> it's spying right, so on me. So as always, we are all leaders and um, we all have different skills and different aptitudes and thus have different benefit. And I appreciate um, all kinds of benefit. I think it's really interesting to me where people value judge as there's only like one type of leader or only one type of benefit or one type of value in the world, missing like the whole world of value. Anyways. Yeah, um, well, so today we have a um, uh, professional structural archaeologist um, with many years of experience. Go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, brag or whatever. Uh, we're anarchists here, so there's no real format other than we just try to be honest and just tell the truth. 
you know. Yeah, well, um, uh, well, I'm from the north of England. Um, okay. Which is uh, a sort of industrial area, and now the equivalent of, our, of your Rust Belt, if you know what okay. I mean. Okay. We got deindustrialized in the 1980s, just when I decided to go to university and become a mining geologist. <laughs> right. Oh. Um, so I've got that sort of geologist background and a geologist way of thinking. Um, uh, but I ended up having failed lots of exams. Could, because... you, could you please explain just really quick what that would be for people? Since I don't know exactly what. I mean, I have a basic a geologist is about minerals in the ground. So I was seeing yeah. that I, I, had, I, I, I mean, I'm not well, stupid. So I would think that when you look at things like I'm an artist, I look at things critically as an artist. Like, how yeah. would I draw this? What colors are, you know, shades, you know, depth, whatever. So I would imagine that a geologist is looking at the minerals of things, the colors, meaning copper, yeah. meaning gold, meaning possible silver or whatever. But uh, but also could be water or, you know, because of clay or anyways. But could you could explain what it is to you? Well, so you're looking at the landscape for a start. You're looking at the landscape as a whole in a sort of big big picture as big a picture as you want really and then when you get down into fine detail we're going down into crystallography we're looking at things in thin sections down a microscope i identify okay. individual micro uh, individual minerals um you're using all sorts of science and within it of course are lots of specialities but i originally wanted to go and sort of because i grew up in a mining area and uh, we had literally slag heaps in the back garden i i, yeah. I <laughs> um great for sledging on um so i i have a, i'd had a scientific background with with an interest in the landscape and glaciation and all those sort of processes that affect right. the landscape um and also i'd been brought up in the countryside i don't know about you guys whether you're urban or there's a big difference between urban people and people I, in the I, countryside i am a street kid i, I, I right, was okay. born in long beach in los angeles i was right. raised in los angeles and orange county so and most of my, uh, uh, until I, and I didn't leave in uh, um, Cali Southern California, Los Angeles area until I was like um, 30, I think, or something, yeah. or 28. Anyways, so really most of my growing up, everything was, so I'm very street. I didn't, in fact, yeah, yeah. just to show you how street I, I was, I remember the first time I, I became a truck driver and then we drove outside and it, it blew my mind. <laughs> I had never, I, well, I didn't know. I had never seen yeah. like gaps where there's no city. I had yeah. never seen that ever. Like everywhere I drove, like you could drive a hundred miles almost and it's still city, you know, but all of a sudden you go out and just my, like 200, 300 miles, almost just like one little tiny town. Tiny. I mean, I had never in my experience, that was just so bizarre to me. And the other thing to me that's really was bizarre was the experience of like people having different experiences than me. It's very ethnocentric. I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, but I also realized how everybody in a sense is so encapsulated. See, like Corey's actually from Canada. Yeah, and all right. someone okay. says that you hold you have a you have an encapsulated view of now him compared to if you would have thought before he was an American. So, no, I hadn't. I, had no, 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 I, I wasn't judging you. I'm, I'm not, no, no. I wasn't. I wasn't judging Corey either. Yeah. <laughs> no. well, all I'm just uh, saying is, I was just making a point that encapsulated. I really realized how encapsulated we think, and how hard it is to think out of that, and how you think like you know everything in this little capsule, and then you look outside, and it just it blew my mind. Yeah. Wow. And so, so the, the whole history of my truck driving. <laughs> Was be my mind blown of experiencing things. It's the way to go. Truck driving is a very interesting thing. You see, I drove a million from, miles I've from a long way up as well. State, I've been to every yeah. single state in the United States. I've been to four provinces of Canada, and I yeah. also did went to Mexico, but in my own personal car. But I mean, so I got us this. Actually, I realized to really be multicultural, you almost have to be culturally multiple. In other words, I mean, experiencing multiple things. And this is why I think archaeologists is such an a, um, a era, a sense above people when they're looking at the past or culture, because you understand all these multiple cultures that are in, like, say, one given area. You said North England. 
North England, yeah. when you think about it like a time span of cultures, as an archaeologist, there's just tons all on top of the same spot. In, yeah. a sense. And that in the same like landscape. The, yeah, in the, the same landscape. Like, That's the important thing. It's that landscape. Right. It's, because I, one of my sayings that I've created that I want to put out there now all right, go uh, ahead. is uh, history repeats itself because geography is slow to change. Right? Right. Because geography is slow to change, history repeats itself because it's the same geography that's driving these things. If you, you know, that's a good point. Um, I, get, I, I can understand that from understanding my my pre, uh, understanding of prehistory. Yeah, Just like but I, it changes. Before, the, 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 everyone forgets the step. How important that was to human cultures, and Eldrin also to me forgets the inner mountain corridor. That thing was just as important as it, almost more important in a sense for changing cultures than even the step was. They, they both were massive. Not In a sense, more step actually probably uh, germinated in the step because it's also bigger. Yeah. So you have more chance for multiple. Well, where the other one, just the Intermountain Corridor is more like a route to go somewhere and, to, and where ideas transferred back and forth. I would say it, did, it, it itself doesn't have a lot of like towns or anything along it. It's just what it gave. But like you were saying, well, that 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 right there, what the landscape, it's all mountains. It's not very good for living where the yeah. step is is high, but at least it can give a moderate, you know, level of living compared to the mountains. Well, you've also got the aspect of being able the aspect of being able to see. Mm. If you live in a, if you live in a forest, you don't see very far. Right. Okay. <laughs> um yeah. well, if you live on the step, you've got a much de- greater vision. It's like this Terry Pratchett made a great point about the Arabs being interested in astronomy because there's nothing else to look at in, that, in, that, in the desert. Um, uh, because uh, there is something in that, in the sense that, you know, geography also dictates the sort of culture that you're going to have to create. Um, totally agree. And we can see it accelerated. It's, it's very obvious in, in a modern sense because, you know, I, I, I don't stop the processes in, in 0 BC or whatever. Um, when you see what's happened when oil becomes important right what that does to the landscape what that does to oh. the culture and it you know that's just the world <laughs> um but the same thing happened in the bronze age what people forget oh, yeah. is that in order to smelt all this enormous quantities of bronze that they produced they had to cut down every last bit of wood they could find um and unless you're being you're being sustained about it and that became the issue was they would take the they take the ore all the way to cyprus because they had lots of trees, right? right? And they'd smelt it there because there were the trees available. And that had an impact on the environment. The Greeks building ships had an event, uh, um, impact on the environment because they'd take whole trees and cut the, the, the board they wanted out of a single tree so it curved, right? Wow. <laughs> right? Incredibly Waste. wasteful. Yeah. Right? The wastage oh, yeah. is huge. They stopped, but they ran out of trees, right? So they had to start building frame ships with planks. Right, just because there wasn't the wood available, you know, to do the things that they used to do, you couldn't recreate the solar barge next to the pyramids because there's no trees that big left on the planet. Right, you'd have to wait a few hundred years for them to get that big. Right, uh, right. Uh, and well, I, I know, with, even like in, uh, um, I can't remember exactly when they made lime, I, I think it was 9,000 years ago, maybe it's 10. Yeah, but, but when they started making the lye plaster or lime plaster, you know, walls. They thought it was all the rage. All of a sudden, all the houses get it until they burned all the trees. Yes. <laughs> yes. They, yeah. they not only could they not no longer make plaster walls for their house, they had to leave because they couldn't live there. Yeah. Well, it's a big thing. I mean, the whole uh, the logistics of Hadrian's Wall, which is one of my specialist areas, oh, yeah. the, um, the it's Roman entirely wall, yeah. created how much wood you need to burn to create the lime to stick all this shit together. Right. right? Exactly. Um, and, and people have sort of questioned my uh, my modeling, but I, I start from um, forestry yield tables um, because we've been we've been growing trees for a very long time and, and doing it sensibly, because, particularly because we're a naval com- uh, country. The shipbuilding we needed um, demanded that we literally grew trees to demand. So we, mm. we 
legally preserved forests so we would have the wood to build the ships that we needed to rule the world. Right. Um, <laughs> sort of gone out a bit recently. But um, uh, so there always was an interest in, in, in forestry. And I've got books going back hundreds of years about how trees grow and, and you know, how to harvest them and, and, and how to use them. Um, and that is a tradition that goes way back, way, way back. Because if you're going to build houses, you need to be able to grow trees consistently. Oh yeah, well, and, you and can't go out building long houses in the um, Balkans at least seven thousand years ago. Yeah, and you've got and, to have a consistent supply of wood. You can't just go out and cut down random trees. The yeah. trees have got to be. If you look at the post holes, they're all the same sort of size, because they're Why? literally yeah. farming the trees because yeah, it's see, part of here, farming. You've got to grow area, trees that you need. And here's an area where you're definitely way, way beyond me because I have almost done no research on wood <laughs> structures of any kind. I know, I, I know it's important. I put it this way: my my goal was actually not to become knowledgeable of archaeology or, or whatever. It was actually to debunk religion. It was my goal, and so. But I started realizing I can't do that adequate without getting an understanding of both archaeology of anthropology of culture of ethnography of dna of everything i started realizing i gotta get this human global perspective to really adequately explain religion because i i felt like a lot of people before just say say stuff you know they'll say yeah. oh, well religion's false well that's true but i can help you understand why it's false and what really yeah. happened i think that's more it's more credible to me. Yeah. Well, as an archaeologist, I've certainly become more interested in, well, my father was very religious and I grew yeah. up and until I went to university, probably um, I grew up in the church. I, you know, I served at the altar and did moderately high Protestants. So I was, I was familiar. I've always been familiar with religion. Right. And my father was quite, quite involved on a, on a lay level, as we'd say. Um, but that all went out the window as soon as I got away from home, along with a lot of other things, which is why I didn't become a geologist. Um, I, one of the advantages of living in a town is you get used to being in a town. Right. Uh, <laughs> one of the advantages I have is I know more about trees than you, but I didn't know much about booze and sex and drugs and rock and roll. And my first year was a complete mess. And I ended up as an archaeologist, which is a sort of downgrade. Right? It's still an it's still an ology, but it's about the I, lowest ology. I think it sounds to me it sounds cool. If I, I think if I probably would have got, gone back and done different, you know, yeah. I, I went into psychology, yeah. but then I realized right away that I, maybe I should have been a sociologist because psychologists more like analyze. Oh, there's a problem. I'm like, yeah, let's do something about it. Like now, yes, <laughs> like yeah, we'll hope that one person like. Hey, do you think that one person made the problem? I think we need to hit the systemic problem, like all, and so we need to be more, you know, social stuff. And so I really, I, then I dropped out and started started to give it masters in and social work. But now, but now actually learning more about archaeology stuff, man, that's, that would probably be a lot more fun. Well, I'll tell you my degree. Uh, um, it's archaeology with philosophy, psychology, oh. geology, and ancient history. Wow! Look at you. <laughs> He's the man. Uh, uh, only because I, I had to study extra subjects to get away with it because I screwed up my first year. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a degree with two special dispensations in it. <laughs> right but, on. Uh, I'm dyslexic, which doesn't help. Um, so I have to work by understanding. I can't just book learn. I can't just rote learn. So I have a, I've always had a sort of, if I don't understand it, I don't want to touch it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, have to, mean, I have to be able to work it out from first principles, which I can't do with spelling. English language is a nightmare. It's a complete yeah. nightmare. Yeah. I'm not good at spelling. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I spelt, when I got to university, I was sat in the university in the first year doing archaeology lecture, and I'd spelt boat, B-O-T-E. And there was a ripple went down the row next to me. <laughs> Who's this idiot? Um, yeah. No, I, so, let, me, let me stop you for one second about that. Yeah, and I think that's a real issue. Like even with me, someone's looked at my spelling before. Like I wrote this long quote; it's really great. Then one word I misspelled, and then he was making fun of me about the word. Yeah, and yeah. I'm thinking, did you miss the whole quote? It was awesome for this one. I didn't yeah, spell yeah. the word. So I, I think that it's really stupid to always assume that someone makes a mistake that somehow they are valueless. It's like, it's just it's judging a book by its cover. 
Yeah. That's a, and I have this problem all the time. I actually, going back to the real world, because I as, when I was working as an archaeologist, um, I started before there were proper spell checks. Mm. Uh, the first compa computer we had was an Apple IIe, which is probably before your time. I'm not sure. But it was oh, literally yeah. the first computer. And they gave me a database and said, we've got all the pottery on a database. And I said, it won't fit in the computer, right? It can't. His memory's not big enough to handle this amount of data, right? <laughs> Forget it. It was a while before we got a PC. Anyway, I submitted a, an application for further funding to the government through through the, the appropriate channels. And they sent it back because I hadn't. I'd nobody checked it and like, <clears throat> this is we're not giving money to an idiot like this right because it was so badly spelt and uh, yeah anyway so I, I i thought archaeology would get me away from having to write stuff but uh. <laughs> <laughs> i have to have someone follow me around and write things down for me right because right. i'll get the numbers in the wrong order and it's all about numbers in the real real world of archaeology oh, it's I'm... layer 703 cut by feature 747b you know it's all that sort of stuff and you you get that wrong and you're screwed actually oh yeah especially yeah. All, all the all the artifacts go to a museum yeah. and they're all cataloged <laughs> wrong bro oh, yeah yeah oh. well, I, i've had people do that to me i had somebody who didn't understand it well enough um they got a job this is an interesting interesting example with the local a local government and they got the job basically because they were disabled right they had a balance problem and oh he can be part of our seven percent or whatever it is and he wasn't the best person for the job he was the worst person for the job in in real terms actually and i'd already picked the person i wanted but i wasn't in on the interview <laughs> i said oh he's obviously the person right he's got the right qualifications and he got all the all the stuff from one feature and stuck it all together and it was the most important feature they're all in separate Layers. It was about 150 years worth of stuff in there, and he just bundled it all together because it had the same overall feature number. And I could have died when I found out because <laughs> it's too late to do anything about it, you know. Um, anyway, strange story, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, because in the, in the of, of a really nice um student I had, I, I trained truck drivers when I was on the road. All right. That's actually what got me into thinking about psychology was how how oh. how, how good I was working with people. And talking to them and stuff, making them feel better. Anyway, so the, um, this one guy though, he just—I don't know what, but he wasn't mentally smart enough to be a truck driver. Yeah, yeah, that, that's. I mean, because the reason why I mean, maybe at, at at driving local, but not over the road. You have to to navigate yeah. all kinds of highways, and then you have to in advance all kinds of math in advance. I need to figure out eight pounds a gallon for the, yeah, yeah. the diesel fuel and i need to have 300 gallons because of course i'd figure that out too how, how yeah. much distance it is and then figure got my out load to consider the and then figure out how much of the and i gotta figure out the load is forty thousand two hundred and whatever you know i have to figure out that and then then wait i'm going over to canada so that's into tons and the bridge is 42 tons is that oh yeah <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. If you, it, 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 oh yeah, it's a, all I these things are still set because I thought, oh, this is going to be easy, and it was like, and I don't like math. It was math, math, math. Yeah. Was, it was almost more math than I could take because I don't, I'm very, not very good at math. So even I'm super smart, but not really good at math, and so it was almost more math that I could do. But this guy, he could, he couldn't do it, and I tried so hard. And he was such a great personality. I could told him, be a trash man at home because I'm serious. You just need a route. Where it's always the yeah. same, you'd be great because there's nothing wrong with your driving, but this is taking more aptitude than you have. So I know what you're talking about, and I, I feel bad for the people because everybody's not for everything. I mean, imagine yeah. a world where we demand that everyone learn or be great at everything. That's like someone said to me with all the stuff that I try to do. He said, "Why don't you add more humor?" I go, "Oh, so I I don't do it. <laughs> I, I freaking need to, should I learn dancing too? I mean." Uh, well, the strange thing is, I've got I've got exactly par parallel experience to yourself because yeah. when I gave up archaeology, um, I I couldn't keep it keep it up, and wa my wife ran off with somebody, and left me with four kids. So I set up my own wow. business doing IT because I've always been IT kids. literate even before there was IT. Right, <laughs> I had one of the first computers in British archaeology. Um, so I set up my own business and I started doing it, what was called in those days voicemail and right. uh, call logging press one for yes two for no it's a new idea my first job was with a local with a with a national bank right piggybacking onto a system they had and um so i got to go 
everywhere, right? From Joe's Caravan Park uh, to Motorola or every prison in Scotland, right? And train people, right? On a critical system, right? And I had to be confident. Though they let the, they had to sign up for it and say, yes, I'm confident I know what I'm doing. Because in some cases, it's quite critical, right? <laughs> that they know what they're doing or they could screw their life up. It does, sometimes doesn't matter. I don't really care. But the same, the same standard has to be applied. I did work for the police, as we call them around here, the police force uh, and government agencies and stuff. So um, and the weird thing was nobody ever met me. Uh, the people I used to work for were in the south of England. And they just ring me up and say, Jeff, go and do this job. Mm-hmm. And they paid my invoices by return. Right. Because I was competent and they just found, oh, we found someone who's competent. We can trust. He's <laughs> it's not going to screw it up. He's not going to turn up with his ass hanging out of his trousers. <laughs> right. And he's not going to offend the customer. Right. right. But it's a really tricky job because, as the police say, you've got to decide whether you're going to call the guy mate or sir. Right. <laughs> yeah. When you serve them in a retail park. Right. It's, you know, you're right there, mate. Or is yes, sir. Um, and it all depends on what what level you think they are. And I used to have, they used to, I used to go in, the first thing they'd say, always wear a suit, right? Always wear a suit because you get treated different. You turn up in a fleece, no, no, they're not going to offer you a coffee, right? <laughs> but if you turn up in a suit, they'll offer you a coffee. Um, I've got a soldering iron in my briefcase, but, I've, you know, <laughs> but I'm in a suit. Um, and I, they'd say, uh, milk or sugar? And I'd go, no, coffee, right? <laughs> Which is one of my little jokes. Canadians get these things. Um, <laughs> And I'd go I'd, and I'd use these bits of humor to try and assess because at some stage I'm going to have to sit them down and train them. Right. And if you're the IT manager for Barclays stockbrokers. Right. Um, you're going to be, I'm going to have to be slightly more tactful when I train you right, <laughs> than somebody who's and I do get occasions where there's nobody there but the janitor. All right. And he's never used a computer. Right. And he's struggling with a mouse. And you've got to say, this is not going to work. <laughs> Yeah. And you've got to front up and say, no, I'm not going to let this go. And speaking of computers, when you were saying about entering the um, the data for the uh, pottery, uh, yeah. um, wh- what about enter this all the information about wood and wood structures? Because I'm sure that, that it made it a lot easier to also search a database of other um, information or sites. Um, <laughs> well, archaeology is very hard to get itself integrated. It's divide and rule. Right. With uh, it's never been it's it's gone from being a charitable institution uh, uh, with a few little government bits to being a commercial institution with a few little government bits. Uh, and nobody wants to talk to each other. For example, the the dendrochronology dates, which all the database of dendrochronology, that's worth a fortune to somebody. And they ain't going to let anybody else get near it. I tell you that, except for money. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, oh, I, oh, I well, then, see. Yeah. I, I just learned yeah. something because I once again I don't look for wood. But I didn't know that they, there. I I would have thought that there was this great database you could search. For sure. Yes, yeah, in theory. Um, <laughs> no. um, depends who you are, what you are, what access you have to stuff, and being on the outside of academia, which I very much definitely am. I have to pay for stuff. And my local library used to cost me like 15 quid to get a volume. Right. And uh, so my research is rather centered around the information that I've got. Um, But there's no shortage of information. There's no shortage of, you know, things to work on that I've already got, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And occasionally I I don't want any more information. There's also a lot of good information um, that people have done. And there's ResearchGate and can't remember this but other um, academia yeah, yeah. stuff that, academia.com and stuff oh, like that yeah academia.com yeah they're they yeah, yeah. Stuff too. I, I i to me that's that my favorite type of reading i don't yeah. I, I do read some of the, the the news you know archaeology stuff but more just because they make a point and that's the all that matters to me too, yeah well i tend point. to uh, um i've uh that's that's a book i was let's see if we can get that there yeah there that one that, right uh, on right i contributed to that book that's my right only on. academic extra. I'm only accepted in America, but I got my basic peer uh, methodology peer reviewed over there because I was uh, I was approached by a, a, a guy from Ohio um, who literally uh, Bill Kennedy re- literally sent me a draft of a paper. And he said, I've written this paper for you and I've put your name on it. <laughs> wow. Um, and because he just take it off my website, basically. Oh. Um, I was going to say, wow. Yeah. That, that, that is <laughs> and I said, all right, okay, you've, 
I, 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 we'll both write Here, it together. Here, I've given you a paper. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we'll both write it together because because it was my stuff that got him going. Yeah. I, um, that because he's my... practically involved in building buildings. So the <laughs> issues that he's got are the ones that I've got. <laughs> I'm not concerned about, you know, the social space within a building or, or you know, its usage other than that becomes apparent from its structure. I've got the holes in the ground where the foundations go. What does that tell me about the roof? Okay, that's my basic approach. And um, as long as I've got the plan of the building and ho hopefully a few sections and bits of pieces like that and depths of post holes, that's all I need. I'll just get on with Could it. Could you explain you depths? Because doesn't depths mean it, it has to hold uh, a larger weight or? Uh... Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, it, yeah, a larger weight or taller. Hmm. It's normally taller. Okay. How, how right? do you tell that that's... it's taller and not just like a heavier structure? In other words, what I mean is, like, say, that, like the um, the Leaning Tower uh, uh, or the, um, the the in Babylon, like the the um, gardens being you know hanging or something. The fact right. that I don't know how hanging they. Well, were. the deeper foundation would mean the heavier thing, yeah. Yeah, I'm just, uh, with, I'm just with post holes, it's what, probably if the you, same. If you raised it, uh, off the ground a structure and then put dirt and plants and stuff like, but if you could walk oh, under right. it, you know what I'm saying? You would have to be pretty uh, um, stout. To, is what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. To, hold, um, to hold that up. Yeah, well, that's mud brick architecture, of course. Uh, what you can do with mud brick is something entirely different. Um, uh, with posts, posts are very exceptional things. You've got single points for your. You don't have a load bearing wall. You have a series of points. Right, right. Now, right. and generally speaking, the nearer you are the middle of the roof, the the greater the load anyway. And you you can't necessarily assume that they fully understand. The engineering of their own engineering right, right. they do it because it works right, right, right yeah. <laughs> and they're reluctant yeah. to do it any other way because they know it might not work with a building and, it's and a bit critical really you don't want it falling down because you get a very bad reputation and people go oh, bugger this we're going back to the caves right <laughs> yeah. um so but, but, I, but uh, I would add too that, that to me a lot of the stuff that they do also surrounds religion that whether they, yeah. they mixed yeah like like you said structural archaeology in the sense what worked and then they would say, well, and that structure is God's, you know, or whatever yeah. spirit. This is our ancestors point. There's, you know, the, 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 why it works is what I'm saying is I, I think that a lot of archaeology is totally correct. They're just missing, not everybody, but some people missed it. A lot of the social behaviors they're doing is definitely motivated by religion. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I don't think there's any great mystery about religion. Okay. Um, I agree. It's sacrificing, it's singing, it's dancing. There isn't a lot more, more you can do. There are there ain't any magic secrets <laughs> there at all, right? Um, <laughs> I agree. What, what secret rituals did they do? Well, they probably killed something, probably, and looked at the inside of it. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's no great it's no great thing. Um, now, I'd be happy to talk about religious architecture in terms of Christianity, because right. there you see the adaptation of Roman forms of of, of building. I mean, the basilica was not built for Christianity, right? It was an existing mm -hmm. Roman structure that becomes adapted to Christianity, I right? Didn't know that. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, so what happens is you take the existing architectural forms and say, well, this is the biggest hall I can build, or this is, the, you know, or I take an existing hall and adapt it, right? An existing, you know, there's no reason why we might have pagan temples really get it for Christianity or any other religious transformation. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what but I, I look at the architecture. Don't, don't you think first. that's in a sense the religion dominating others? Like my God, they get kicking the one because he, you know, you kick the god, the gods out or whatever, and you put your god. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, there is that process going on. I'm going to focus now on the architectural process. Okay. okay. So one of the curious things about Christianity is that we worship in graveyards. What what's that about? Well, I'll tell you what that's about is that. Under late Roman law, you weren't really allowed to uh, just do your own thing religiously. But when you buried people, you were. Right? <laughs> that seemed fair enough. You know, if you want to give someone the first rights in their own religion. But the other types of religion were more prescribed. Right. You had to have a statue of the emperor in your temple, you know, whatever it was. Right. Which is what caused all the problem with the Jews. They didn't want statues of emperors in their, you know, non idol based religion. Right. Um, so. So there is that one thing. So what actually happens? 
what you usually find in a Christianity is you have a, 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 a one end of the church is the nave, which is where the religious bit happens, which has a sort of religious focus. Uh, then there's the chancellor. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I'm getting the wrong way around. Uh, what's the main bit of the church called? <laughs> Yeah, I truly but the main I, the main my, body my of the church were evangelical Pentecostal. Yeah, yeah. Well, the main and so they they would they would meet like in in the the basement of a school. I mean, yes. and then, well, yeah. that, there you have it. That's where the it's you know the early religious uh, uh, rites we find are in the basement in the in the catacombs where people could go down among the dead and do their stuff, right? right? So we find the earliest Christian traces in Rome, for example, are in the catacombs. Hmm. Right. So that's the, the the way religion is being shaped. But we get one end of the church, which belongs to the church. And the, the bit behind that, where the congregation sit, belong to the congregation. Right. <laughs> and they're responsible for the different bits. So and the, they meet at the chancel arch. Hmm. OK, so the, the nave end and the, and the, is, the, is, is responsible of the, the priest in the church. Then they, the, the congregation have to look after the bit. They don't want to get wet. <laughs> Standing outside the holy reliquary where the, the priest is, perhaps based around the grave of a of a, a founding saint or a founding father, right. so 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 you get that sort of effect on the architecture of you know of religion. It works both ways, but the idea of of uh, Christianity gradually develops its own architecture, obviously, but originally it just takes over Roman forms. You know, that's, that's how right. Romans and, built and buildings. To me, in the Roman forms, took took on the Etruscan forms and the Greek yeah, yeah. forms. Yeah, yeah. But the, Greek the Greeks forms. took on the Cretan forms and the Greeks yeah. took on some of the Egypt and some of Turkey and and yeah, and they're also some Indo-European, so it's a little of a mixture. Yeah, but so I mean, the, everybody, but the whole point that I, I realized learning free history is actually everybody's been taken from everybody. <laughs> I'm going to put that in front of you. There yeah, you Beckley Tepe. I looked at that because I thought I'd bring you a present. <laughs> and I looked at it the other day and that was roofed. Definitely roofed. Uh, yeah. No doubt about it that that is a roof structure, right? It's got the same type of truss that I find in the LBK. My interest in 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 roof right, so, and you, and you, you mean the linear oh. linear band pottery culture of yeah. seven thousand four hundred or something in yeah. 20, maybe so yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I get ago. interested as it goes up the Rhine. Um yes, it goes, you know, goes up the Danube and then up the Rhine. But but let's uh, not talk uh, that's where ours because, come from. I know, but let's not talk to explain please explain what you're I mean, I know what you're talking about, but right. We don't need a conversation with just you and me are totally getting it. And everyone else is going, what the heck is going on? <laughs> right. So, so, okay. So, no, this is a, but, so just this explain is the culture. So you said that the L, the, go ahead and explain up the Rhine, explain what you're talking about. I'll, right. I, I, I love all this. So go okay. ahead. And well, my, you want. Right. I'll start up. My baseline for architecture is the arrival of farmers. Okay. Who have specialized architecture and they turn up. Principally, I think, on the islands off the coast, first of all, because that's easier to colonize. So the Isle of Wight, uh, the Orkneys, uh, places like that. Um, and then gradually move inland and gradually take over. And they have a totally different culture from the Mesolithic people, whatever level of you know, subsistence they had. These people arrive, they're fully agricultural. They've got cows, they've got sheep, they do weaving, they've got every sort of crop. They understand timber, they grow wood for their houses. And they've been building the same sort of houses for several thousand years, right? right? And they have a very consistent form of architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my base point. I thought, well, these are the first people to bring architecture here, and I'll work forward from there. Um, and when I first looked at those, uh, it took me a long while, but eventually I worked out how the roof truss works. And they have a very interesting, if you look at the plan of an LBK house, it's slightly irregular. It's got a twist to it. And that's because the roof itself is perfectly square, right? But the thing that holds it up has to be offset because we're not talking about bolt together things. A post can't go through something else. Things have to fit together, right? right. And the more things you fit together in one space, the weaker it is. The more wood I have to cut away to join all those bits together, if you follow me. Yeah. And when I join a piece of wood together, I have to cut 50% of it away, right? Right. So that makes it fifty percent weaker mean, at the point so, I want it to be strongest. Right, yeah. but you're talking because you're talking about the the woodworking where you take wood and you cut a, a, a notches in them, 
and then yeah. you put the wood together and it makes the bond without glue. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, yeah. You have yeah. to hammer and you have to hammer it so it, it's so tight, you have to hammer it the wood the well, joints I, together, correct? Yes. Yeah. I know well, this is also something they do in Korea and in Japan. Uh, that that would work is slightly different, I would have suspect. Mm -hmm. For, for, uh, for other reasons, which I'll go into if you like, okay, yeah, because definitely. they have a very similar tradition to the LBK, which is very yeah. interesting. Their, their basic um, uh, Chinese house is very similar in its structural principles. Uh, and they've, they, they've developed it down a different line because they have to deal with earthquakes, which we don't have to deal with in this part of the world. Right. So that they retained the design because of uh, the importance of earthquakes. Over here, we went for load bearing walls. Right. Uh, and it, which is a, a feature of our architecture, which are susceptible to earthquakes. Um, but going back to our friends, the LBK, what I worked out eventually is that there is a twist in the plan because in order to get the, the roof truss, which a roof truss, basically, this is hopeless. Um, I forgot where my camera is. A roof truss is basically a, a, a triangle, okay? okay, with a tie across the bottom. Right. Because okay. like a pair of scissors, if I push down on the top, right, that's going to push out. Right. OK. So what I do is I put a tie across the bottom. That's how a roof works. That is the most simplest engineering principle that we have is it's basically a triangle. And then when I stick it up on a set of sticks, right, it then becomes, you know, if you imagine it. Yeah. You know, like a, like a building. OK. Yep. Now, the more bits I join together at this corner here the weaker it will become. Yeah. So what happens is I actually put the post. Oh, I've broken that there. Okay. Oopsie daisy. I don't have to put the post right under the joint. I can offset it. Right. right. And I've created, a, I've created a cantilever and it doesn't have to be perfectly straight as well. Uh, and the wall can be on the outside of the post. Right. And if you think of a Chinese house or a Japanese house with a paper wall, you know, right. that sort of concept of a really lightweight wall. Yeah. Right. Uh, because it's not carrying any load. The post on the inside is carrying all the load. Okay. Mm. So now one of the aspects of this that I noticed is that these these pairs of posts opposite the opposite each other in a building are always have always got a slight. I'll take one of them out. Actually, that one out. Uh, I've always got a slight twist to them. I hope this. Uh, <laughs> yes. Talk about dyslexic. There's always a slight twist to the posts. Right. So, but the roof itself is perfectly square, but the posts themselves are twisted because they can't be in the same place at the same time. It's a bit of an odd concept to get to. But so what happens is that this tie that runs across the building is at a slight angle of about three degrees. Mm -hmm. So the posts are always offset by three degrees. Yeah. But once again, three is, is a magical number in religion. But well, it varies. At least, yeah. at least well, I would say at least possibly, yeah, but that, but, possibly uh, thirty thousand years ago. Careful, Damien. Three degrees is our concept, right? <laughs> that's our measurement, right? Um, uh, one of the things that interests me is that by the Bronze Age, by the age of Stonehenge, we're measuring in feet and inches. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, bang on feet and inches, and I couldn't separate them. Well, there so, are bits so where, people, uh, hold on, but. Stonehenge. No, was all I was. I wasn't gonna say anything. Yeah, I, I, was I, I bounced a, a bit. Here, Stonehenge. Sorry. I was gonna ask because Stonehenge starts at five thousand. I think some one hundred or something. Yeah. But it's just a couple little blue stones, I think, and then Probably. later. But my point is, so are you saying that it was all the stages were like that, or or that's no? All this I, I'll, I'll tell you the story of Stonehenge. Um, though I want to finish with Gebba Tepe. Yeah. When I looked at Gebba Tepe, I found out that. The uh, the pillars and the the particularly the bases in the wall where the ties would go because you mm. want those are for horizontal timbers at the base of the wall, you know those little shelves in the wall. Right. And when I started mapping those and putting the timbers in, they had an offset from where I thought they should be of mm. about three or four degrees. They're also exactly the same width as the uh, as the long houses, right? Because that's the other thing. It's very easy to make a uh, the difficult thing is making a wide building. Long buildings are very easy to make. You make them as long as you like, right? But a wide building, it's difficult. Right, yeah. I, you're talking about the so I'm, I'm pretty sure. I never, I never thought about that, actually. But yeah. yes, I can yeah. totally see what you mean. 
Yeah, that's the clever bit because I can only I can only have about twenty foot unsupported maximum. If you look at your house, it's probably about a twenty foot beam somewhere in your house, but not much more than that. And after that, we have to go to sort of uh, aluminium. I mean, if you go down the local mart and have a look how, how what's holding the roof up, you'd be amazed. It's sod all holding it up, right? Because yeah. <laughs> there's no weight to it, right? Because right? right. uh, it's 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 aluminium. Um, uh, uh, or steel, or you know, it, it's lightweight stuff anyway. Um, whereas, because that's the problem in a building is how to make it wide, right? Um, uh, so it won't fall down. Because the other restriction is that I can't start joining timbers up together. Now it, I can bolt two bits of steel together, and I can put a scarf joint, as they call it, in timber, where I join two bits long ways. Do if you know what I mean? If I get two bits of wood, I can join no, them. No. Uh, if I want to join two bits of wood long ways, uh -huh. okay, like that way. Yes. That's called a scarf joint. Oh, I didn't right? know that. Right. And they use them in medieval buildings, but only sat on top of a wall, realistically, or something like that. Because to get the strength, compressional strength, or, you know, it's going to be really difficult. Because the other aspect of, of, of these joints is you'd probably peg them. Right. What I do is I, I put the two bits of wood together in some way, put a socket socket them together then drill a hole which is fairly easy to do uh, and then put a piece of wood circular piece of wood like a, a dowel, right, bang, dowel bang that into the hole they'll hold that in position right so i don't have to make it that tight uh, the japanese wouldn't peg it we'd peg them right the japanese would make a joint that was so perfectly accurate yes. it wouldn't need pegging right well, and, and the koreans do too and, yeah. but, I, but i think that originally that does come from the same or similar culture idea yeah, yeah. as the LBK in the Balkans and in, or actually in Germany, they, they, it was more because they did go yeah. a little bit, little bit into the Balkans that they call that the um, East uh, LBK and the West LBK. But the, um, but, the, but that culture was, was large. It went from Germany all the way to. Yeah. Um, well, it was Romania very successful. Romania or whatever. I mean, it's like. Yeah. Well, they were the first agriculturalists, and they spread at the rate of how fast you can clear land, if you know what I mean. Well, they were For also, the next generation. Right. And I, yeah. I also say that they were the slavers and the, the murderers yeah, yeah. because they right. went and they killed the indigenous population. Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. I was going to quote, and sometimes I remember the how many, but right now. I, I think I think it's quite like you, you know, it's what happens to indigenous peoples when agriculturalists turn up. Yeah. Um, and, and it comes to the, the, the fundamental principle is that agriculturalists have something to protect. You can't just move on, right? You've, you've yeah, cleared yeah. the land. You've you've you've, like you've you've done all the the engineering that goes into farmland is something oh, that yeah. needs to be considered. You know, in terms of drainage, um, the, the infrastructure of a farm extends to its gates, its passageways, its pathways. It's you know, it's it's water it's supplies. It's land. It's saying I yeah. I put this stuff here. This is mine. Right. Yeah, so you can't just move on. Whereas a hunter and gatherer could go, you know, oh, well, we'll go off somewhere else and annoy someone else. <laughs> but that's that's you know, so that's the origin in a sense of of uh, of warfare and aristocracies and people who do have nothing better to do than stand around and um, protect you. And, and then you need the, say, and then you need the religious people to stand around and say, "This is right. This is what we need. This is the thinking <laughs> behind all this." Yes. And if you do this, life will be better when you're dead. Which is basically the message we we get sold, isn't it? Don't worry, it'll be better when you're dead. Yes, yes. Yeah, You'll have your yeah. own cow. Yes. <laughs> Excuse well, and, me, while I turn the heater on. And I would say that that is exactly <laughs> arcane capitalism starts right there, and it, and I think it's actually two sources. It's not just well, it's actually, it's actually three, really, in the long run, because there's a, a first kind of thing of the North Asians, I think, that hit the Balkans, and they they that starts the culture. Then that inspires with already people coming from Chavahoyak from Turkey. That inspires the LBK. They, you can already see they're different because they yeah. start violence right off the bat. It just they go in. I think thirty percent of the population. I want to say or I can't remember the <laughs> but, they, but they just go in there and yeah. they just, boom. And then they're the first in the world to just totally say this is ours, and they pass down by lineage, doom, 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 like. Male lineage, male lineage, yeah. or we're a clan. You already know they're, and then it's they start doing what I say is they generate wealth. 
That's why I call it capitalism. You have a person that takes over the land of indigenous people. I don't know. This sounds like something that's happened before. Takes over the land of indigenous people, totally slaughters them, turns a lot of them into slaves, right? And to farm their land. Of course, the indigenous land, that's what I'm talking about, by right? their land. Have, have the, you know, the indigenous people farm their own land for the other new people, the, the colonizers. <laughs> and, it's a, well, um, it's a... <laughs> and then, I was going to say, and then they start getting accumulation of product, and that is when you have wealth imbalance. And the medium theme that comes to wealth imbalance, as you said, is people start to be able to aristocracy sit on chairs and do nothing their entire life, never working a day in their life, their entire life. Where the other people, even indigenous on their own land, are slaves actually farming and, get, you know, kind of like capitalism. Give it all your resources, all to these other people. Well, the, the curious thing about this, they don't sit on their asses all day. They do mesolithic things. They go hunting and fishing. Right? Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, the curious well, thing. Yeah. They, 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 they yeah, recreate from. the lifestyle that they've destroyed. They go off and, you know, <laughs> Tutu Carmen's out there shooting shooting birds and, and enjoying himself in the in the marshes. And calling it sport. What they still do, you know. Um, shoot right, yeah, not because he has to. Because uh, he he needs to still feel manly as yeah. he's doing nothing. Yeah. yeah. Well, apart from fighting each other, which does become a major industry. Oh, well, um, cracking heads. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, that becomes that becomes a, a really interesting industry. Uh, but uh, my interest in this uh, is really the technology, because. The wealth that's generated, particularly, I think, in the Bronze Age, because that, that does allow oh, yes. something very special because you can now have very, very specialist weapons, right? Because how much you can do with stone and wood, do you know what I mean? And, For, and well, apart yeah, from I, I, manpower, I, I, and what we see in the, in, the, in the Neolithic is a demonstration of wealth through manpower. People digging enormous no. monuments and moving stupid amounts of things about just because they have the manpower to do it. Because that's all it is. There's no, there's no magic to it. It's just that you've got a, a load of blokes or a load of slaves or a load of whatever it is. You've got the manpower yeah. to demonstrate this by putting up hundreds of megaliths or digging huge ceremonial ditches around your Neolithic whatnot. Um, but what we see, and I think Stone Engine expresses this very well, um, is that this probably starts out as a Neolithic monument uh, with a, a ring of stones of some sort, and the stones represent something um, or somebody oh, or speaking various of something, people. It, I can't remember, but I thought because I don't get that much into like some some of the stuff that people say. But I is it correct that Stonehenge might have been a lightning strike area or something that they then venerated? <sighs> Because I, I heard yeah, something yeah. about some of the the <laughs> circle uh, monuments relate to a lightning strikes on the ground that then later. Yeah. Well, they certainly. Well, you could understand that in a mostly forested environment, uh, open spaces would be interesting, and uh, interesting trees, struck trees, things like that are right, interesting. Right. They're 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 strictly avoided by uh, by our engineers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have anything to do with anything that's a tree that's got anything wrong with it. That, that's that's a sort of folklore thing. So, um, but in general terms, what we have is just a, a Neolithic. I mean, a henge is just a circular field, right? Yeah. That's all it is. Nothing. Right. It may have had a hedge bank. Do you know what I mean? It may have been a circular hedge. It's not really anything more. You could have anything you want within it, right? right. It's, it's it's one of those terms that gets misused in a sense. So, um, but at some point, which is where it gets interesting for me, somebody takes these stones. And now these stones have come from Wales. Now they they may have started, they may have been brought here specially, or they may have been stolen there specially. They may have, you know, they may have been someone else's stones that they stole, or they may have been stones that they commissioned, as it were, to be brought because um, they're blue, because blue was their favourite colour. That's my theory, and I'm sticking to it. Um, <laughs> well, and see, um, I, I, I mean, in my prehistory stuff of like things, blue also relates to water, which can be underworld, yeah. which people yeah. don't understand. Underworld actually means up in the heavens, the stars. Yeah, D yeah. So there D is D no actual unless it's bad. It's it, all, when you go under the water, 
you actually go up to heaven. Like if, it's like I, I said before about sky burials. People get, yeah. get this confused. When yeah, a that, Christian that, puts the person's body seven feet underground, well, shamans make a pyre seven stacks high. That's when you they get to this ancestors. Right. So they build it's, it's, it, it's the same kind of it, all this stuff is similar. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, so seven feet down is also like they say, number of God, right? Because number of the afterlife or or non yeah. non human life, in a sense. So that's why there's depth matters. Yeah, not because of animals or something, but because of religion. But so, anyways, so blue well, oh, oh, yeah. also is sky, which they also <laughs> thought was water. <laughs> well. Uh, I, I am. I'm not going to cheaply go down the route of what people believed or perceived. In yeah, I'm not because, claiming that because it comes why. down because it comes down to the individuals. That, yeah. Yeah. I, you notice yeah. I didn't say I know that the blue stones <laughs> were this. I was yeah, just yeah. Saying, no, no, I'm, no, I'm, I was yeah, offering I'm an idea of I do know that what I said is true. Does it apply to these blue stones? I don't know, and I wasn't making I a speculation you, of knowing. I, I, was just I could saying... tell you a funny story about this. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about this. Go ahead. Yeah, before I digress completely. Um, in East Anglia, where they have fantastic preserved wooden remains uh, um, from various periods that are, that are quite, well, um, quite well excavated, but not understood, should we say, um, they found these little round quartz pebbles and the, the excavator said, well, perhaps they were brought to the site as because um, in, in a ritual way, just like the blue stones were brought to Stonehenge. And I'm going, yes. And they couldn't possibly be slingshots then uh, or fishing weights or anything practical like that, because they're the only stones you find in East Africa in that part of the world are eroded out of uh, uh, quartz pebbles that erode out of the sand. There's a lot of sandstones with quartz pebbles in. So but, there was but hold no on one second about just about what you said about the, they couldn't be these things. My what? statement would be: I don't believe that even if it's those things, it has to be only limited to utilitarian. Because I still oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just no, I wasn't saying you just said this. I was just making yeah, a yeah. comment. I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I said saying... one person said, "Oh, look at these fishing stuff." I go, "Uh huh," and it was still religious. Man, I mean. Well, it's got it's got a bit mad in British. You've got to remember, British archaeology has gone completely mad. Um, I, well, I don't know about the, 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 the <laughs> academic what archaeology has gone completely insane. Um, uh, they're talking to trees now. Um, anyway, Stonehenge. What do you, what do you Stonehenge, mean right? Let's get back to Stonehenge. I know I'm, I'm safe ground with Stonehenge. Right? So okay. at some point, at some point, the blue stones are laid out in like a horseshoe shape. Um, inside a massive timber building, right? And that's Stonehenge One, from my point of view, mm. right? Because when the big, when the post holes, there's, there's hundreds of post holes, not hundreds, wow. but but um, between 100 and 200 post holes in circles around that site. Okay. Then at some stage, that is taken down and then mm. rebuilt with this stone load bearing wall and these five stanchions, right? which in engineering terms is weird, right? And not good. You should not mix different types of foundations. Right. You can mix different types of material. You can have a wooden roof on a stone building, but you shouldn't really have stone pillars in a wooden building because mm -hmm. they behave differently under dynamic loading in terms of wind and heat and, you know, just timber structures move a lot more than stone ones, full stop. So it's a bit of a daft idea. But it can only be explained in terms of importing the craftsman. You know, in the tradition of uh, giving gifts to people, you would send the, the, the Minoans would send the Egyptians a whole bunch of craftsmen to decorate their palace in Minoan style. Or craftsmen well, you to... one second, which proves Minoans were not equalitarian. Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think sorry. That's fine, I mean, I just gotta keep reminding yeah, people. Yeah. Quit worshiping kings. They're, they all sucked. Beautiful as a woman. They, I'm just saying, Minoans had women like this goddess worshiping, you know, stuff. Yeah, yeah. I agree that a lot of stuff was goddesses. It is not all goddesses. It's not all one no, goddess it, either. Yeah. Quit calling it all the same goddess. It's not. It's like calling everything the same god. It's ridiculous. But, but the yeah. other thing is that 
this overemphasis of this wonderfulness of somehow every time a, a woman is involved, that it's going to be equalitarian. There was a lot of equalitarian and women often were involved, but it is wrong to think that every time well, some woman cannot be some sadistic psychopath, especially <laughs> with, on a wealth driven <laughs> greed or selfishness is, yeah. is ludicrous. Um, my favorite is the, is, is Habshetsut. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's a really nice graffiti about her, uh, dear old Barry. <laughs> People drawing drawing uh, uh, pictures of Selma shagging uh, uh, Hapshetsud. Right, which the... probably could have got them killed if they would have been seen. Yes. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, which talks about, which is in a sense to do, you know, people say, well, this is what the Egyptians believed, et cetera, et cetera. No, not those particular Egyptians. Those are particular quite well switched on as to what was going on. Thank you very much. You know, not everybody is naive or, or credulous, well, as it were. I totally it's... agree with I totally agree with you. In fact, I've said this before on, on another show about Egypt. Everybody talks about Egypt like somehow everyone was like this cultish. Every followed every single thing that was told of them, and every single like, well, yeah, they did kind of have control. But yeah, come on, have you yeah. seen that work now? It's not even North Korea. They have the Jonsi religion. Is it a hundred percent? Really, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's the practicalities of it, which is something I, I, I sort of wanted to say about. I didn't come out and start talking about religion and archaeology until after my father died mm. because it was quite important to him and uh, you know because socially religion is incredibly important to a lot of people because it is the, the framework for which their social lives work um leaving aside whether it's uh you know the uh the, the religious aspects of it the social aspects of it can be quite positive in some respects and well, for example, well, in the in, in the medieval you period, you can point to positive. Yeah. I can guarantee I can yeah. point to negative. I'm not, yeah. I don't want exactly. to look exactly. at that right now, but but yeah. this just sure. can we get back to Stonehenge? Yeah, right. So so what we have is curiously enough is we get the import of this strange craftsmanship, which I think is is probably molten somewhere like that. Somewhere it would if you found Stonehenge or the bits of Stonehenge that you see lying around in Malta, nobody'd notice. Do you know what I mean? Right. So because the the key thing is that Britain is the principal source of tin, right? Correct. In Cornwall, you cannot you cannot have bronze without tin. And you've got to get it from Britain or you've got to get it from Afghanistan or fairly remote deposits like that. Uh, there was there's was some further north in Europe, but by and large, the, the Bronze Age in Europe is being powered by British tin. And, and that we, includes tin and from Britain made it all the way to Israel. Yeah, yeah. So it's an important it's an important trade. So who's ever doing that trade, the Phoenicians, whoever it is, I'm not quite sure who you'd want to who you'd want to label, um, are dealing with these people. And, and so there is a gift exchange. We find items that you find in Mycenae turning up in southern England. You know, the, 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 and people tend to dismiss that. But no, that is important. That's why Britain has got this. And why we've got Stonehenge is that somebody sent a, a bunch of stonemasons, right, uh, to build agree. this bizarre structure uh, because it is architecturally very interesting. But the curious thing about Stonehenge is it's a traditional Neolithic stone circle, a bunch of stones, all kept in the middle of a temple inside a keller, inside which becomes even more of a keller. By the time you've got a dirty great ring of stones, and a double row of post holes on the inside, right? Uh, which make it even more sealed off. You know, it's even more protected. We've got your religious monuments and they're in our temple, right? Um, it's a sort of ownership of an existing right. There is something quite interesting political about that. Uh, oh, because I, I totally agree. That, I think that's some of the, the uh, to me, the capitalism that hijacked paganism. And then uh, it kind of like rides together and looks, if you were to look at it from probably historical perspectives and not prehistorical, it would look like they came together or like that they, or that somehow, because no, king, no. think of this, how many gods also worship kings or support elites or, or, or you have pictures of oh, them given, <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying like a lot of yeah. with Egyptians, the, the, all this stuff, even the Minoans, yeah. they're, you know, the gods help, the rich people, they don't like, part of the, package. The, the poor over the rich. I mean, yeah. 
So my, my they want them to. It's a divine right. It's, 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 well, yeah. it's yeah, what so we had in this country. Up, the poor people or yeah. the, the rich ones? That's all until I'm 17, until the 1740s, when we cut the head off our king and said, right, that's enough of that. <laughs> right? Um, and we did it a lot before a lot of other countries got around to it. I mean, it was a yeah, long time before I, the I French got around to it. I don't believe in the violence yeah. of cutting off someone's head. What I would rather is we cut off their power. Eliminate well, that, their power. Was, take away their power. I mean, that's... Yeah, well, that, that, piece of, that piece of violence, that piece of theatre was, in a sense, very important because it brought an end to the link between religion and and uh, the monarchy. Because the, the issue was that Charles I thought he was there because God made him um, king and therefore he had authority. And that all of that period was all to do with religious authority, which was all to do with the breakdown of the Roman Empire. Because from having a divine head, a Pontifex Maximus, who was the Pope, who was Julius Caesar, for example, was Pontifex Maximus. And it was Augustus that said, right, I'm going to become uh, the military head of state and the divine head of state, I am going to be chief priest and chief of the army and chief of a bunch of other things. But but I'm going to leave the Republic to look after the bits that the Republic looks after. It's an amazing bodge job, the Roman Empire. Right. And, and out of that authority comes Christianity, because at some stage they say, right, we're going to make Christianity the official religion and not empire, emperor worship, as it were. And off we, and or, off we or go maybe down. they and, or maybe they did both, and that's why Christianity. Yeah, yeah, it, it's quite it's emperor not, worship. Yeah, it's <laughs> quite complex. It's quite a complex <laughs> process because it's not as if Christianity started off the way we think of it. Uh, you know, in I terms totally of agree. our Christianity today, uh, you would recognize it. Um, uh, well, first off, Jesus made a comment that no one that was hearing his voice, in other words, his twelve disciples would die before the end so jesus yeah, yeah. It was just, already yeah. told everybody that it was going to happen before his followers died mm. so two thousand years ago the story was already up why everyone keeps yelling for a party about a story that's already ended <laughs> I mean, well it's about uh, well it, it, again it's the it's it, it, it's the Israeli tradition of apocryphal leaders who are going to come and, and rescue them, as it had, yeah. had actually happened, uh, with, with, where they had been rescued from the Greeks, right, as yeah. it were. Um, and they assumed that somebody would well, turn and up and do that. the Persians take them from the Babylonians? Yeah. And the Persians yeah. allowed them to, I think, have their religion more, which made right. them more... Speaking which of is, they, they, they paid for the temple in Jerusalem. The Persians paid for that. And, that's, and they established the priesthood, which then become the Pharisees because they're the Persian backers. And people like the Samaritans were sort of Israelis that had never been taken off to Babylon and were left behind, I think. Right, right, right. I did, I'm, I'm getting into it, it, slightly out of my specialist area. So you had all these factions. Um, but what broke that, of course, was the Romans turning up. Um, and oh, so not bit, truth? Uh, so it wasn't about truth, truth? woman? Oh, it was power okay. woman. Okay. Okay, well, let, I'll have to put my principles as an archaeologist out there. Is that I can't have a magical true, uh, magical past. Okay, so what I have to have, so what I have to have, is a rational explanation of where all this stuff comes from. Right? I totally agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the thing is that, and that leads just, to that there is no magical past. <laughs> yes, because yeah. um, if you have a magical past, you're in trouble. You've got to, you've got to have gods. You've got to have everybody's out there doing stuff, right? Oh, you can't just oh well. There's just what it's again. What we started with the first comment you made about exceptionalism and in individuals, right? We need an individual. We need a person who's got the, the you know the, the the way. It's the same idea. There is a single individual that's going to come and save us. There's a single God. There is a single principle that's going to come and save us. It doesn't work that way. It's never worked that way. And when it's tried to work that way, you end up with Adolf Hitler or Vladimir Putin, as we have at the moment. Uh, what, individuals what, what, who assume that they've got some sort of divine mission. Um, well, now, and they also, it's ownership too, right? It's, yeah. it, that's why I hate nationalism. Because <laughs> it's this belief that you own anything. You own land, that my people own anything. What the, all that to me is insanity because the truth is we're all animals just like the other animals 
No, but the animals don't own the earth. We don't own the earth. Not one human to me owns the earth. Yeah. Well, there, there, there is that definite we sense all of entitlement. Are sharing this. And, and when yeah. we look at who's historical, yeah. everybody in Europe who's not brown is not, in a sense, original people. You're a colonizer of some time after 7,000. Yeah, yeah. This no, is a fact. But but so I'm saying so. But, but people in in that are white in in Europe, like say Russia or Ukraine or wherever, feel they own the area. I'm just saying, in a real sense, that is not true. You just mean when you started to be here, meaning you yeah. took it from someone else. I, I I really hate all this. But even them, if you look at like a historical map of what countries, oh my god, everything is like all over, and everybody's taking over people. And then they take over by war and violence and say, this is ours, our country. And people love this idea of in thinking back. This is the bloodthirsty psychopath that, that swathed and killed this area, a million people or whatever. And that's now what we call our land and we'll fight and die for it. It's just, it, remember the history? You're fighting and die for yeah. the psychopath that took all this land. You're fighting for, for them. Yeah. Well, it's. Uh, it's it's when you look at history, um, uh, we have 1066, probably a date you may have heard of in in English history. We have 1066. Isn't that which, when the Vikings show up? Uh, no, it's when the Normans showed up, who were actually Vikings originally. Uh, a guy called William the First, otherwise known as William the Bastard, um, and he showed up with 10,000 people, uh, about an army of about 10,000. We had a population of about four million, and he just decapitated it. Right. He just killed all the aristocracy because our king at the time had already gone up the north of Britain near where I am and killed the Viking king who had invaded to try and get in charge. Right. Wiped him out, come back down and nearly beat the Normans. But in the end, he got killed himself. He was called Harold, got shot in the eye. Um, and then the Vikings, uh, the Vikings, the Normans went off and took over and they came up to my part of the country and just uh, what they'd call harried. They burnt everything down, basically, and killed everyone they could find, uh, because that's how you deal with the north of England. You do. <laughs> you just. Well, but but uh, truly, uh, if you know history, it, it, that is how people have interacted because of yeah. warrior cult mentality yeah. and this elite power driven type of thinking that I could own and other people. It's, it's, it reminds me like I'm a big dude. right? I'm big. I'm tough. I'm aggressive. I'm, I'm strong. I'm not afraid of almost anything, but the point is, what's the real value of me? Is that the value or is my mind? It has nothing to do with strength, nothing to yeah. do with size or anything or loudness, right? It's not loud that people listen to me. It's, it's the wisdom. Well, it's the ability to solve problems. I always think is, is what you want. Is it, in but, your but I, but I just want to go back to values that, yeah. So it, it's hard. That's why when I try to look at the past, I try to look at it. Um, I hear some people tell me that, you know, they do it in a Marxist or whatever. What I, what I try to do is I try to put myself in the, the, the weakest of persons. Yeah. What would it have been like to be a child and you're watching people invade or you're a ch poor child and you're watching these rulers talk about how great they are and build all these things where you can't even eat? I try to think about what would that experience be like? And that's how I, in a sense, try to connect with the real, because, because in a sense, yeah. all, uh, histo too many historians, I feel like tell like, you know, fantasy novels, like they want to, you know, make Disney stories. That that's, that's not reality. And I don't yeah. like fake. Yeah. Well, part of the problem of projecting yourself into these situations in that you are just projecting yourself into these situations uh, right. Because you've had the advantage of the best education the world can provide and probably some of the best education the world's ever provided, if you know what I mean. Though there was a time a couple of thousand years ago when you could know virtually everything there was to know <laughs> because <laughs> there wasn't that much to know. Um, though the world was, for, you know, there was endless amounts of religion you could learn. Right. They often, you know. Well, well, they yeah, uncover these the ancient libraries, way. they'll be all full of nonsense. That's half the problem is they'll be full of nonsense philosophy um, and not the information that we'd love to know. Um, so, I uh, OK, do you want to continue the idea about the Roman Empire? And yeah, where definitely. That, Go for how it. That, how that led to Christianity? Well, Go for it. The, the, the curious thing for me is the idea that Christianity arose from somebody called Jesus living in the 
30s in, in the Middle East right. is a bit like saying the Germans recruited a Polish Jewish SS division to fight the Russians. You go, <laughs> what? <laughs> Every other fact that I know about that period, right, <laughs> contradicts what you're telling me, right? Right. So either that fact is wrong or, <laughs> you know, because so where does all this come from? Um, because we cannot trust religion or priest, the priesthood, religious texts is written by priests. That's what priests do. They write religion, right? You know, oh, where do. does this stuff come from? Well, that's what priests do. You know, that's yeah. what a high priest's job is, is to write this stuff down, right? And, and to propaganda. make this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's basically propaganda. So what happens is that after Herod, the well-known uh, character dies, he sort of, it, it, his dynasty breaks down and he was a, a Roman apologist, right? And had the backing of the Romans and he'd put a lot of investment into, the, into Israel. And it had become quite Romanized. He, he built new port facilities, done all that sort of uh, modern integrated leader. He got on very well with the Romans. But after he died, it all fell to bits. And eventually there was a big row about putting an emperor's statue up in the temple, right? Because it becomes what you do. Because when a Roman emperor dies, um, he becomes divine, right, to the Romans. But for well, the people... Sometimes pre that because they did and, but as well but for, the, but for the yeah. peasants for the peasants oh, he's peasants, already divine yeah, yeah yeah and for the colonials he's already divine right, um right. or at least he should be acknowledged which which in a in a, in a polyatheist society in a, where we've got a pantheon of gods which you know more or less relate you've got a female god we've got a female god type thing it wasn't such a big deal for most religions right to somehow rub along with this because it's just another statue but for the jews it was a big deal uh, it, it precipitates a huge rebellion and eventually uh, Jerusalem gets sieged and destroyed effectively and the temple gets burnt to the ground. OK. Um, and about the same time, Trajan goes off to be emperor and there's the trade. There's an arch in, of his triumphant and you can see him carrying back the candelabra, the, 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 the branch candlesticks and various other treasure looted from the from his campaign in 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 the east. Um, now, when he comes to die, um, they have to decide that he's divine, right? What you do is you get the rest of the Senate, which is the sort of House of Lords of the uh, Roman world. Uh, they have to devote on him being divine and say, yes, he's divine. You can now worship him. He's now officially a god. And his inscriptions will have Divi after his name, as in God, right? Um, and... You know, his successor will be son of the divine uh, oh, yeah. Trajan. I, so that's the, the most yeah. important part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's very unusual. You, you talk about this idea of, you know, people being struck out of history. Very unusual. Very unusual. You've got to be really, really bad. And the, 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 what you're judged by is not the fact that you've just wiped out the Jews. You've, you've actually not killed too many of your own aristocrats. Right. You've, no. you've managed to rule without being a complete bastard and killing everybody. So, yeah, yeah, you can be a god. Um now, I think as part of that package, um, they took the account of the war, which is Josephus's account of the Jewish war, and they got together a little document that said that Trajan was predicted to come and destroy the temple. That this big guy kicking around who'd been saying, look, one day this guy's going to come and he's going to take the world and he's going to destroy Jerusalem and blah, blah, blah. And the idea is that's meant to be Trajan. Right. In the core of that document, which is Mark, the Gospel of Mark hasn't got any. The original core of the Gospel of Mark. Don't they call it the, like the Q document or something like that? I don't know. No, no. I don't believe in Q. You know, there is only one document and it's Mark. Everything else is based you on don't, Mark. You don't. Because, you, well, uh, at well, there's a guy called Atwell. I'm not. Well, yeah, right? read, Everything read, is based on Mark. A, you I take read, the story in Mark. It, uh, and then go, Ingrid, oh, he's not divine. Or whatever his name is. Do you know what I'm talking about? Irvine Finkelstein? I'm probably yeah, yeah. totally gosh. Totally yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but the Finkelstein's to do with the, the history of Egypt's archaeology, I think, probably. Finkelstein. No, but but he he does he did I think I I think that's the one of the books I read about where he explains where all the books of the old testament and all yeah, that yeah. come from. And to yeah. me, so I, I was saying the same thing. Isn't there isn't there that's what, that's also one for the 
because you know, he was talking about also documents like pre documents before any of the Bible. And then I yeah. know also there was a because I can't remember his another can't remember his him or someone else wrote a Christian one I read where it said there was a pre document. But you said, yeah, you well, don't... it's just generally it's generally assumed because we have to assume that well, people who study Christianity are Christians. Okay. <laughs> That's part of the problem. In order to get the skills <laughs> in Aramaic and the other things that you need to be able to do to study this stuff seriously, you've got to go to a very specialist college and you've got to be a pretty signed on, signed up sort of people. There are a few people about Richard Carrier, for example, who are sort of, I'm slightly agnostic Christian, so I can study. And he got a PhD and everyone went, well done, you got a PhD in Christianity and you're an agnostic. Um, and he's almost exceptional. Um, but... When you look at the, the uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, which date from this period, where Jerusalem's being destroyed, they rush off and hide all the religious documents they can get their hands on in the hills, okay? There's no mention of Christianity. Christianity doesn't exist. There's no, there's no Jesus. There's, no, there's, there's people saying, well, there's so-and-so is a bit like Jesus. And we've got a list of like 14 or 15 different people who are messianic leaders in that period. Um, there's even come called Jesus, but there's none that matched him. So the whole thing starts with a story in Mark. Then somebody else says, takes that story and says, no, well, that's not quite. Let's add a bit more to it. Let's well, make I, him. I agree. Even because in the, the original Mark, right, yes. he, he gets put in a in the tomb and that's the end of it. Correct. Right? Then people right. come along and start adding a really then. Then Luke well, comes along the and says it's two paragraphs or a pair, yeah. two, two and a half paragraphs. Yeah. Is then a Luke, total forgery. Luke, yeah. Then Luke comes along and adds all this stuff about lock, lock, uh, lock, lock uh, journey from Egypt because they're also because they're also trying to tie in with other religious documents, and they know that oh the, the Messiah will come from Egypt. Oh, so he has to escape from Herod to go to Egypt so he can come back again. So they have to invent this whole concept of the census, which is also nonsense, right? It's not, it's not a real thing. Oh, you have to go back to the place where you were born. What? What's all that about? That's just well, made and, up, and, and, right? I agree. That, 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 that's, that that's right just, there yeah. to me. So is... that's just, a, you know, so there's a full of these devices in order to get these, these things, you know, so you can fulfill prophecies, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have to have a, you know, son of so-and-so, son of so-and-so, so, you know, to prove his lineage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that, that 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 document, which was originally prepared to big up Trajan as being the guy who was predicted to come and be, do divine things and, uh, and, you know, finally sort out Egypt, as Egypt, Israel, and destroy the temple, right? I think that document becomes a genesis of both Christianity and rabbinical Juda Judaism, which comes out of that in a sense, hmm. out of that period, is to... Is to you know, what do you do when your entire religion's based around the fact that God lives in this box in the Temple of Jerusalem that's no longer there? <laughs> it's been flattened, right? And of course, the, the final death blow to Israel came with Hadrian because Hadrian turned up at the ruins of Jerusalem and thought, what a fantastic place to build a temple to me. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. And let's have a, oh, I can have a big temple. It's a nice spot, isn't it? Yeah, we'll have a temple dedicated to me. And that sets off the Bar Kokhba rebellion, which ends up with literally the, you know, the place being leveled and razed everywhere. Every Jewish settlement was razed to the ground, and they were all sold into slavery or killed. So, and that was the end of uh, until the Balfour Declaration in the 1940s, the idea that we could have a Jewish state, because Hadrian wiped them out. But you know, he's not remembered for that. Oh, right. <laughs> he's, not, he's not one of the good emperors because he wiped out the Jews. Right. Um, but that was that was again. That's the sort of thing that went on. Um, yeah, and the, that's why I'm saying I do not know. And <clears throat> to me, almost all leaders today are probably well, not all, but a, a good amount are or have been done stuff or related to stuff that happened become war criminals. That does not mean that I think like currently as what I wanted to refer to. That does not mean that 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 does not make Vladimir Putin also guilty of war crimes yeah well it, it's, so, it's but, but i i want to say this is a common thing well it's so it, 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 leaders <laughs> yeah. produce this shit is what i'm saying yeah well, and if you say oh well it's not their fault things happen yeah because of other countries 
and other leaders doing shit and causing problems. It's been elite fighting each other, and then it's almost always not the elite that are dying, right, or their children. It's always everybody else. Yeah. Well, um, I live in a country that was very much shaped by the Second World War. Yours was as well. Uh, well, my, I think your country your comp- died uh, by by yeah. by the Germans. Yeah. So, uh, so it I was mean, shaped, but I, I'm not. But then again, but your country was shaped by the Civil War, I think. Because unfortunately, that coincided with um, the mid uh, mid eighteen hundreds, uh, and between about eighteen forty and eighteen sixty, the world, the Industrial Revolution really got it. Do you know what I mean? That's when it picked up. And you think about mass production. You think about Ford. Well, Ford hadn't even been bored. You think about Colt, right? People like Colt pioneered mass production and producing firearms for the Civil War. And you ended up with a civil war and a settlement, and there are two, three, four million modern uh, military style arms in circulation, right? So you then have a, have a situation where everyone in the population is armed, right? <laughs> Which is something that never happened over here um, in any context. So we, it's, it's, so you, you can see in the civil war, you now have, that's affected your society in a strange way that everyone goes around well, I think it's also and is scared of each other. I know, but, but yeah, civil war, but civil war does relate to slavery, and I think slavery more relates to the gun issue <clears throat> because originally, I, I I know that they had rules where the people could catch slaves, people could in a sense bounty hunters and kind of yeah, like. yeah. So bounty hunters had to be able to have guns because it would take alive or dead, like you know, signs alive or dead. Well, I, so, yeah, I think the native population probably had. To be- <laughs> <laughs> probably had more of an influence on the survival of guns. Well, uh, well no, the, I know, but, I, but I'm just making a comment that, that yeah. the, the desire to have these are to, mm. in a sense, produce a, a certain outcome. To me, like someone said before, like, uh, uh, you know, should we ban guns or whatever, or guns are a right? To me, protecting yourself is a human right. A gun is a product. Mm. Uh, so is a missile, a airplane or whatever, a car. These are products that doesn't mean I think that we shouldn't have a access to products, but I do think that because it's a product, it's not inherently a human right. Yeah. yeah. I, it, it's in, the, in this country. Let's, let's go back to our friends, the, the Normans arriving in 1066, because they did this amazing thing called the doomsday book where they went around and literally counted every pig they could find in the countryside and worked out who everybody was and exactly what they owned. So that's how we know there were 4 million people here. We also know wow. that about 17% of the population were slaves, right? How many? Bang on slaves, 17? right? 17, about 17, 18% of the population was, are slaves. I, I just wasn't sure if I heard the number. Yeah. Um, but above that, you've got things like villains and cotars and things like that who aren't much better off in a sense, but they've always got someone to look down on, right? And that's the other little subtlety about society, about stratified society. Um, at least I'm not as bad off as him. And at least I belong to oh. somebody, right, who will, who nominally will protect me and, and looks after my interests. So being owned by somebody is probably not a bad thing um, in some societies. <laughs> it gives you a certain status that I'm, I'm, I'm owned by somebody posh. <laughs> um, so th- there are a lot of nuances there in, in the way society is structured and how one perceives one's status in that society. Though my particular interest and is a very small specialized group of people who are the architects whether these people are also priests and another sort of thing is another thing but that that is not something that we do communally right you I cannot mean, carry the mathematical skills to build a building in your head because you'll only have to do it once in your life if you're lucky right maybe not even that right, right. these things will last 100 years probably at least Sometimes maybe only 50, but I, you know, it's not something you're going to undertake yourself. There is an idea that people build their own houses and there is a culture of that in certain subsistence levels. But in terms of the LBK and people like that, you have a specialist guy who knows how to do this. And he's got the measuring system and the maths to do that. And he's not literate. That's all in his head. And this is a, a tradition of passing it down father to son or master to craftsman type thing. So that tradition is amazing,ly stable, uh, and they are the people I'm interested in, 
because later in society, when you can see, you know, uh, in the medieval period, architects and builders can travel internationally. They're international figures. They are very specialists and they're, right. they're, they're sort of immune. They're, they're a specialist middle class. Yeah. And that's exactly what the Smiths become. But they, the architects have it first. Long before we've got Smiths, we've got architects, right? Uh, and they're I, I responsible totally for all that. of that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so they're the people who know how to build uh, the specialist stuff. I mean, they get you know they get the slaves to do it or the, the craftsmen to do it. But you've got to have these master craftsmen who can carry the information of exactly how to build these structures. And they get very, very complicated. And they get way more complicated than people would ever give them credit for. And that's part of my problem, is that I'm pushing it out against an artistic culture rather than a technical culture. Because our ideas about the past are conditioned by pictures that we've seen. Oh, definitely. Right? There's a lot of thinking is done in pictures. And oh, if you've only ever that. seen Gebe Tepe as, you know, all these spooky, oh, it's like Stonehenge spooky, right? You're not prepared to think of it in terms of, oh, it's a building, right? It's, it's, it's a timber right. structure. That's what that's all about. It's about a whole bunch of stuff to support a complex timber roof so we can get on worship our gods and not get wet or <laughs> get covered in sand and shit and have the birds crap on us, right? Um, well, yeah, I did, it, I did think it had to do with sky barrel. Absolutely. Of course, this is what I would say. To me, it was like all of them, Stonehenge or any of this stuff, to me, they're not one-use structures. Yeah. That, I think that is a complete fallacy. None of these were, in other words, I'm saying is like now we think of like that is a Jewish temple only for, you know, synagogue or this is a Christian to only meet on Sundays yeah. or seven-day events and meet on Saturdays or something. No, to me, this was the structure like, you know, for the community – and Gobekli Tepe started with men centralized, maybe men only, I think. This is very highly likely. Oh, yeah. Men only, no women even involved at all when it first starts. So Good I'm just saying about the space or whatever, the things. Then later, and there's a, a different culture comes in from um, Italy, and they bring this idea of women. And all of a sudden, you have it blending. First, it's like a, like a graffiti, and then it becomes a pillar, and then it spreads out more into the you know the belief of women and stuff. But it, it, you could tell to me it doesn't start that. So that's like some people like go, oh, Gobekli Tepe was always about women. No, it started men. I think only like because even the yeah. animals have penises and stuff. And so no, no. Yeah. That, that's another aspect is that you've got to consider that the timber structure would carry a lot of the carving on. When you see headless things, you've got to right. think it would continue above on the timber work. Right. right. Well, that, that, so, I, that's a great point. And I think that uh, would also bring in the religion because I know, or I, or I don't know all the things, but I, uh, uh, the, the wood is related more to like life and like this world. And the stone is more like ancestors and afterlife, in a sense. Think of the reason why, just like you said, a stone structure could last 5,000 years, 10,000, whatever. But a wood structure has a more limited, it's here and now. Yeah, but it's the, just the stone structures us, are only good, as good as the wood. Yeah. Right? But I mean, unfortunately, not, the, you, you the Egyptians... see how that would make more sense. Mm. The, well, the this... Egyptians tried stone building. You know, you look at the great temples with stone roofs. But, you know, it takes 50% of the ground area to hold up the roof. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you have 50% yeah, of your ground is pillars. No, 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 no hopeless, big expansions. But and I, people I don't live. About people don't live in a lot, a lot of times it's shown as a star thing. Like, I think if it was that, it was what you said. They were standing on the wood roof and then looking up. Yeah. So, uh, or, so or, or it's still it there looking the maybe window. up. But yeah. The, the, the animals would have been under them. But think of yeah. that. That's like the underworld or something, or the sacred, you know, sphere I, I, inside there. The, the complexity of the roofs that I found, the complexity comes from the fact we need to have windows, right? You can't have... Uh, that's why roofs are complicated, is the need for windows. Um, to, holes to let light and air in. Okay, Right, right. But the also idea of these structures... Smoke, right, is it also to yeah. let smoke out? Smoke out as well. Yeah. Um, and the, the the need to have windows, which are, you can actually make windows with with skin, like parchment, if you want. You can just scrape skin down so it's so thin you can create a translucent 
translucent thing if you wanted to. Certainly did that in the medieval period. That's an interesting idea. It, it, it's idea. certainly, with, yeah. but normally you just have wooden shutters because the idea that you, this stuff goes on in the dark, well, it's ridiculous. You can't have it in the dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so how it's lit is something we don't, uh, you know, I'd have to work on the roofs for a while to sort of work out how that, how it would be well, lit inside. even how it's lit, I agree. I, I would say that once again, I agree with you. They only do stuff in the light. I don't think they're walking around in the dark. But I think mm. it because I, I I don't I don't think that I think that because I well first off I think it relates to agriculture and the sun so they would have cared about the sun and they care yeah. about the moon too and but it's that once again that would have been on the roof looking at it not in <laughs> inside sense, we don't need to look at the sun <laughs> right we don't you know we don't right. it, we, we see right. Akhenaten physically engaging with the sun. It's right. a bit weird in, in a sense. Well, well, they, but they, most they, of the stuff we well, already I, know I meant, about. I meant, what I meant yeah. engaging is a hole. If you make a yeah. hole, because I know that even the Hittites, they would make like a sun temple in a sense where they'd make like a hole in the rock and yeah. it would shine through and hit like a scene or a thing and look like the stone is, you know, God has now come alive because yeah. now out of the darkness, it just, it's bright, you know. Mm -hmm. But so that's what I would have meant by with the, they would, so I agree that the, Temples could look even creepier, not with a, a torchlight, which would burn the roof, wood roof, but with the actual sunlight shooting in there at a certain time, probably hitting a certain animal or yeah. something, or whatever. Yeah. There's, there's or, a, or, that, and that to me would be more more. Yeah, we tend to take things as they are. Yeah, um, it's like Stonehenge. People go on and on about it, and they the, the problem is I my stuff on on the way the roof works and the windows work which i can do and what i do is build it in a cad model um which you know is accurate about six inches or something so um and it's taken me 10 years to get that right hmm. I, I, 10 years ago i decided it was a building <laughs> i didn't want it to be a building because it broke all the rules and I'd, I'd set up a set of rules for what i thought roofs should be like right in prehistory and somebody showed me this plan. Oh, what's that? And so I went. So, so I was asking you about roofs. I feel like the roof is probably flat or somewhat flat. No, you've got to have it not? pitched. It's got to be pitched. And it's mm. quite steep pitched as well. You've got to have quite a steep pitch to deal with snow and rain. In, in our climate, you've, you've got to, you've got to, when you think about a roof, you've got to think, what's it going to be like with two foot of snow on it and a 50 mile of wind, right? That's what a roof right, is. But our climate, but you're, and the you're point is about, that they you're, didn't you're have. You're talking about Gobekli Tepe, so you mean Gobekli yeah, yeah. Tepe's climate, which is well, not heavy could, snow. Well, they might get snow. I don't know. I'd well, they do get some light yeah. snow. I'm not. But I they have to, they, you have snow. to deal with heavy rain, and and you have to deal with wind, um, but you have to deal with all those dynamic changes. And the point is that we can do calculations now, right? That tell us, you know, what oh, the absolutely. likelihood. Um, where and and we work with safety margins, and they work with safety margins. Their safety margins are much greater than ours, to be honest. And what I can see is a gradual progression. For example, in round, the standard Celtic roundhouse, um, you can see a gradual progression in the the amount of foundation they use is gradually getting less. <laughs> They're gradually refining the design, and at some places there's a step change where they start using load bearing walls. Um, but also. There is a definite relationship between the number of posts and the area of the roof, right? And the area of the roof is not straightforward because it's a cone, right? It's governed by quite complex maths. It's not, you know, it's got a square in it basically, which makes it more difficult. Right. Um, so they understood that intuitively, right? And there's a, there's a fantastic thing going back to my idea about roof trusses. The conventional roof truss that you'd see, right? Let's see if we can do that. It looks like that. Uh -huh. Whoops! Right? Whoops! It's got a line in the middle, right out to the top. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. That's good. <laughs> He's hopeless, yeah. isn't he? Um, now, people used to think that that post held up the roof, right? But you could actually replace that with a chain. Hmm. Right. That's intention. Right. <laughs> But it took them a very, very long time to realize that. It wasn't until the, literally the, you know, sort of 18th century they sort of realized that that's how that engineering worked. Mm. You know, they knew it worked, but they didn't know, necessarily know how. And right. that's often the way. When you think about smelting 
and the chem complex chemistry involved in creating copper or tin or alloys, right? They didn't have our understanding. Like they and stuff. they yeah. have they have some system in their head that explains how that works. They have their own version of science, right? Uh, it's not. Well, yeah, I, I would it just, once again. I would say they had religious culture, or whatever religio culture um, yeah. ideas or something, because it would have been both religion and culture. Just like yeah. they, when they, I, they, I know it's like seven thousand years ago, they start putting newer on the on the land. Yeah, like, like they can they can genetically whatever tell they're putting it in Germany. Like I said about capitalism. So yeah, they, but. They, Oh no! It's actually no, recycling. Sorry. It's oh, recycling. No, I forgot. No, I I was wrong about the that where it was. It wasn't in Germany that I'm thinking. I'm so sorry. It was in the Balkans, but I just remember. So made a mistake. But anyways, it was in the Balkans just seven thousand years ago. But anyways, so they um they're putting the manure and and uh they also had done either dog or human. I don't know how they didn't couldn't tell the difference in this one archaeology magazine. Like, how do you not know if it was a human or a dog? Um, Is it that close or something? Uh, yeah, you'd have to look at the parasite eggs. Mm. It would depend on the diet because the human. But dog see, some of the dogs, the they were feeding them millet. <laughs> they were feeding them some of the same stuff they were yeah. eating. Well, they so eat maybe scraps. that's also they're what makes it even scraps. harder. Like they're eating yeah, the same eat stuff. Well, I've actually done some work on this, believe it or oh, not. Yeah. Uh, underneath a, a lift shaft in York, yeah, they found a Viking turd. Right, literally sat at the bottom of a, of a Viking toilet. You could see it just a, a stool, as it were. And they were pretty sure it was human. Uh, and that's our control sample. Because I looked at the, the parasite eggs in that to see if you could tell the difference between them and uh, pig parasite eggs, which are very similar. So somewhere in the library, there's some work by me which helps people <laughs> understand the difference between pig and human shit. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it's literally the most boring thing I've ever done. But uh, <laughs> well, I wasn't trying to bring up a boring fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Relate. Parasite eggs are absolutely tiny, and it takes you hours to scan through a tiny Ugh. little slide for looking for the things. Forty microns. It's tiny. See how fun archaeology is. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's great. And I was in a lab where they were boiling down roadkill for the bone collection. You know, speaking of that note, though, I, I want to. The smells great. Oof. Yeah, speaking of that, on that note, on archaeology is doing all kinds of little things. I want to make a point. And I've made, said this before. I really appreciate all the hard work that archaeologists have done. I would know nothing if it wasn't for the dedication and hard work that archaeologists have done that I can look at their work. So I really appreciate it, and I want to honor that uh, the thankless job that they're often doing. <laughs> well, they don't get paid well. That's the other thing. I've never had a contract over six months. And I've never been paid as much as a teaching assistant, not wow. as much as a teacher. The, guy, the person who sits in the class and helps the teacher, it's about what I got paid for. And at one stage, I was running the largest excavation in the country, Jeez. in the middle of a town. <laughs> Shot a mal-sized hole in the ground um, in the middle of Colchester. And I was working weekends. I used to work in a petrol station, worked in a DIY store. Um, I used to do ground work. <laughs> Wow. Right, because um, you have to work three or four jobs in capitalism. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I've, well, I've know, driven taxis. Wouldn't it be taxis. great if archaeologists could just actually just look for culture and just give us information? <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't yeah. like like somehow having to meet some government standard or some kind of thing. They could just, you know, actually help us understand the past. Just as a, a culture, wouldn't it be great if we just understood? I totally see the benefit of this. I mean, it's yeah. just, I don't understand why anyone has to even argue for it. Like, of course we what? need to understand. Well, it's quite useful. It's labor intensive and it's yeah, not a lot of capital. Uh, yeah. And they used to like it for sopping up spare labor. Uh, my first job was what they used to call a manpower services commission job. You know, I got 48 pound a week. Um, so I wouldn't be on the dole. And I was actually super, supervising an archaeological excavation. <laughs> <laughs> Along with it, I got the same as the guys on the site um, because they could get me on that scheme, as it were. Wow. And it's more or less now we've got we're building a big railway from London uh, up north uh, so people can get to London quicker. Um, and that's generating a huge amount of archaeology. And there just isn't the archaeologist available. So they have to, you know, and then when that's finished, they'll, you know, be sacked. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and that'll be the end of that. Just think, is it because people don't like to learn the, the past or 
utilize uh, their skills or is it simply that people like to get paid i mean yeah it's it they don't want the government has never wanted to make an ongoing commitment to archaeology no. right set up permanent units um so but they should it, yeah every well, government now in the entire world should do this it, well, it's it, now commercial it's own culture supposedly <laughs> well it's got worse in the sense it's now commercial right if yeah. i want to dig out it, it, so um if I want to dig it, make a new housing estate and there's archaeology involved, I'll put that out to tender and various people will, will put in a bid for how much it's going to cost to, to do the archaeology. And it's the same thing with the environmental issues. Are there frogs on the site? Are there trees that need preserving? You know, whatever it is, they all go out private, private people now as part of the planning process. You know, it's when you apply for permission to build a house, you know, they'll contact the archaeology departments, the archaeologists or whatever. Uh, to see uh, if there's an implication, but it's not. It's not an easy job, um, and unfortunately, most resources go into universities, who tend to train lecturers. <laughs> you learn archaeology out of a book from someone who learned it out of a book, All right? Uh, and if you're clever enough, you stay at university and teach other people how to learn it out of a book. So you have none of the skill set of an archaeologist, right? <laughs> You don't solve problems, you reproduce them, right? And if you took your notes carefully 50 years ago, you could still be teaching archaeology today, right? <laughs> Things like the Roman wall, it's the same shit over and over again because we're just copying out the ideas. Um, well, it's like one, one of my, my friends, uh, his, uh, an anthropologist, archaeologist, linguist, you know, it's like five or eight, eight. Yeah languages or whatever it, it, but like babylon and, and assyrian and babylonian i mean anyways but in different different ones anyways my point was that uh he said to me damien the bow was invented everywhere every time it just multiple times that they just shows up and just uh, really no it's not because i think it was a year and a half ago uh 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 uh, I think it's a paleo anthropologist. I think he is. He he put out a thing because he has a lot of stuff in the past. <clears throat> he put out a thing of where the bow comes from. It uh, comes from Southern Africa between 70,000 and 80,000 years ago. And then you see it migrating slowly up, up, up into Europe by 35 and 40, 50,000. It's yeah. over in these. So my, my point was it's total culture. And, and so uh, that, I, that, I yeah. feel like that. At one time, when there was Aquarians or whatever, before archaeologists or anthropologists, people had this ethnocentric view that only certain culture, great culture, could have done everything. That was horseshit. Yeah. Yeah. Still horseshit, by the way. I know a lot of stuff. That's racism. Horseshit. It's basically that's racism. racism. That's just yeah. horseshit. That's right. Even yeah. like, like when I say that, like the North Asians, it was like one got, culture gave it to another culture, and then they spread it to a different culture that then went and spread it to another culture. Then they finally got to the Balkans. Actually, no, they, they got to um, the the, uh, the mountains of the um, Cossack Mountains. And then for some of them from the Cossack Mountains, not the same exact people, jumps to um, Ukraine or whatever. Then someone from there then splits into Germany. But my point is, it wasn't like one – everyone – acts like it's you know i think a long time ago racism definitely and then sometimes now like some magical one culture did everything that's more crap yeah yeah well it's, that's that's <laughs> but, but give us that point it's like, it's like bing, 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 bing. but and also it's like hundreds of years and it, it takes to do all this so it's not like someone planned out oh i'm gonna go and you know take you know that's all i mean it's like this it's same with the ancient aliens nonsense like somehow they knew though everything and they went and gave everybody they were learning as they went. And then yeah. it, it wasn't, in other words, like what I mean is someone took it from North Asia, from China, gives it to Siberians. So now it's no longer than the people from China per se. Now it's the Siberians. Siberians give it to the people in the steppe. Now it's in a sense no longer yeah. the Siberians. Now it's the steppe people. And then they give it to the Balkans. Now it's no longer them. Now it's the people in the Balkans that then give it to Germany. But then now it's no longer them and the Germans that give it back to them and then they go back to China. Anyways, my point is, but <clears throat> it wasn't one thing. It was like a jumping of all these cultures and peoples. It's some of the similar DNA, but even yeah. then, every time it went, it changed. Yeah. Well, so it, my the point other is, thing is, 
<laughs> as with your invention of the bow, we could be talking about an individual, right? right exactly. Who comes up with that idea? Right. Yeah. Uh, and and you know, if you look at the Egyptian pyramids, for example, is a perfect example of of an evolutionary idea mm -hmm. uh, of engineering that they screwed totally. up multiple occasions. It took them a totally. long time to get it right. And again, we see the same thing where Imhotep is given all the credit for it. And he becomes a semi-legendary uh, divine figure as the guy who invents all this stuff. Well, yeah. Um, right, like Elon Musk. It took Musk. such like a long he time. He invented everything. Yeah, but... Uh, but Not. The, the essential core uh, of uh, these ideas comes from non-white cultures achieving anything uh eric Racism. von danigan eric von danigan was with a classic case with his chariot of the gods where any non-white culture that seems to have achieved everything must have been helped by aliens or special white people who a secret race of who had the secrets of blah 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 and it's it's just basic racism um yeah uh, and unfortunately archaeology has got these ideas about cultural evolution that we're all on this sort of cultural journey and to which I say, if we'd left the Native Americans alone, they would develop their own railways, I suppose. Um, which is, a, you know, a ludicrous suggestion because, you know, they, they had the wheel, but they didn't know how well, to well, use it because they, no they, no, they had no pack animals. So they, right, they but, never really exploited the wheel except as a toy. Um, well, but for, first, hold on a second about that. But first off, um, when it comes to um, the Native Americans, this... A lot of people, especially even academics sometimes, have a flawed opinion. They think that somehow after the ice bridge ended, there was never contact again. That is absolute and total horseshit. I'm sure that that's extremely they, they came <laughs> over in 9,000. They came which, which, through the water, boats, yeah. somehow. I mean, they didn't fly. <laughs> so they came through <laughs> in boats at 9,000. Then they came through, I think, at 7,000. Then they come through at 5,000. Then they come through at 3,000. Then they come through at like 1,000 or 1,500. So yeah. that, that's just natives. Yeah. Well, you look then at you have, Inuit. You know, the, the Vikings coming in, I think, at maybe 1,000. Yeah, they had to go. Or something, <laughs> 11, 12. Yeah. Around. Well, they but on the other, the you know, totally other yeah. side. Uh, but they, the, the, the curious thing is, if you look at the Inuit culture, it's sort of transpolar, as it were. It goes, you know, this yeah, but are you talking about the Twicket who have only been there for like less than fifteen hundred years? Yeah, I mean, all sorts of these cultures. Um, well, we I mean, were talking, we were talking about invasions the, the other day. The Aleut are not the same as as the Eskimos. All these are, even though but, I, I think a lot of probably white people just sees everyone up there is like one thing. No, they don't speak the same language. Which, yeah, they're actually not even the same DNA sometimes. No. Yeah. Well, the point is that they're not restricted geographically to a, to a, you know, to a continent. Right. right. Yeah. True. Yeah. You know, know, we're, not, we're, true. Not, we're not, we're not, we're not staying here. We, 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 we're actually, true. we can, we can migrate uh, quite long distances now. Cause something else has struck me that, that we we're talking about South Africa briefly. Um, and you think about invasions, and I thought the Zulus invaded and it displaced the Bantu. Well, no, well actually, uh, well, exactly. The Zulus, well, the, the, but the Zulus, and you're just talking about one clan of the Bantu because yeah. Zulus speak a Bantu form of language. Yeah. Ban so, and the Bantus all came from, from actually all Central Africa. Yeah. Up there, actually, it's Central West, <clears throat> not the, not like Gambia far west but that right right before that that little section there's logos yeah. i can't remember now exactly but but, but anyways uh, but that's where it comes and then 3500 3000 it starts to spread down out and takes over all because before that to me a lot of that would have been haza or or the sand um you know people that, that these people that that are not bantu yeah. and often but, like the has a our animus and, the, and where these people brought totemism down with them everywhere that the, the bantu touches totemism 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 yeah well the uh, big but, the big change of britain um going back to the leaping back even further okay. it was the arrival of the beaker people right uh, because True. they they brought they, they brought killed 90 percent of the indigenous population that well, is they, an absolute genocide well, the beakers were, were uh, to me, were the 
in a sense, the start of the real blue bloods. They had a, the aristocracy. They they were definitely a warrior class. You can make well, various arguments about the Neolithic cultures here and how they were structured, and you know what sort of things they did. But there's no doubt with these their big individual burials and their their grave goods and the beer. They they definitely like the beer, which I think that's with the beaker. By the way, Corey, yes. they would bury alcohol containers. They yes. call them beakers. They're types of like clay pottery, almost like what you're drinking, except take the lid off. Yeah, and give it more of a feminine or or like gourd sort of a shape or something. Well, they were drawn here by the metals because uh, oh, they good. they were working up the Atlantic coast, I think, looking for metals. Well, well, they uh, start well, they start from Russia mm. or somewhere of Siberia, and then they shoot into the um uh, like Poland, and then and uh, into Germany. And then they go down from there. They're all in proto Indo European, by the way. Once it hits Poland and anywhere they're down, the whole Balkans, everything, that's all becomes proto Indo European related. Yeah. Like the well, they came to Spain, and I think they come correct, back. That's correct. Spain. They go, they go yeah. down to Spain. So one branch goes down to Spain. Now, the branch in the north did go, I believe, and also I think it's um, Cambridge, the guy, he, he says they likely, one of the Celtics, because there's like three Celtics or something. And yeah. one of them shoots over into uh, England. And then the one from, um, you said Spain, they go down to Spain and they kill, I think it's 80 or 90% of the, of the population of Spain. They take over. All those people were brown, gone. They killed them all, turned them to slave, cut all their generals off, turned them into eunuchs or whatever. Then they, they go from there, like you said. Then they in, come into Britain, and they really bring Celtic. And they make sure what – the first ones that came in built a little bit, but they stayed more <clears> – <throat> I'm not that familiar with, with England's exact – all the places, but it, it, over in the um, – it's uh, – I would say probably the uh, – is it – I think it would be, it'd be the, the one that faces like um, – Sweden and all that. That's what that yeah, Scotland. The, 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 the yeah, that side. But it was that, yeah. that side. They, they, they were yeah. coming to that side. <clears throat> you yeah. see the well, it's the North Sea. Old. It's a province. It's, it's yeah, sense. The, the, the Irish the, Sea they, is a province and the North Sea the, on the other so side. They're coming is a province. that way first, and it's a bit, and then you see them come later. But the ones that first came, they didn't they did some slash and burn, like you were talking about. They they would yeah. go in and just burn all the trees and they just dominate the whole area, put their little monuments, <laughs> you know, for the sun, the moon. Or whatever their religion and start doing their agriculture, but yeah. the, 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 but they but they weren't as impactful as the like you said. Once the beakers came in from yeah. after just slaughtering everybody practically. Well, you know, th that's the context. That's the context yeah. of Stonehenge. Well, actually, we should say where you get, where you get a stone Neolithic say, stone they circle. Place the population, right? Well, you can't replace the entire population because you need them to work the land. Yeah, exactly. Uh, generally Slaves. Speaking, yeah, you, gotta, you, gotta uh, yeah, you need. need to, uh, that's the problem the Romans had, uh, so, which is why what drove the empire is that was manpower. They needed people to work the land. If everyone's going to go and open brothels and uh, pizzerias in in Rome, um, they've got to have you know people have got to, the, the peasant class is no longer there, so they had to import vast quantities of slaves, which is what drove. You know, a lot of these invasions. You think, what, what do they want from these people? They took a million slaves away, right? Right. And the women and children are worth a fortune, um, and the, you know, the, the the hulking front row forwards uh, are, are useful for quarry work and hard labor and chain gang stuff. That's who built the roads and the, and the hard labor, uh, and the uh, you know. The domestic world was, and, and the farming world was. They take the peasants, you know, who knew how to farm. Uh, yeah, so that's that's really the currency of the Roman Empire. They have, you know, what what do they what what do we have that they want? People. Well, it, it, <laughs> they people want us. Act like Greece is so much better. They're, they you know they, they had democracy. Uh huh. Not for the slaves. They had a complete slave. You know, army to to take care of all these people sitting on their ass and talking about yeah. what, how much rights we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I mean, in, in, in a, you've got an empire of about sixty million people, 
ruled by about 600 patricians right? yeah. <laughs> or about 6 million Romans, right? There's about 10% of the population are real Romans. Uh, and the rest of them are, are, you know, under their control. And it's all run by about 600 people. Right. So, so this, this also, though, is not unrelated to nowadays. No, it, it's not. Nowadays, nowadays, it's somewhat similar. Voting is almost like this joke that we do. Ha ha. Hopefully they won't hurt us too much. Well, it's amazing I mean, that the rich can get us to vote for them every time. It's an extraordinary thing that yeah, people vote disgusting. against their own interests every time. It's an extraordinary thing. <laughs> yeah. And the whole concept of trickle down, which is. Uh, oh, yeah. Which was a fantastic idea that Margaret Thatcher brought in, uh, <laughs> that Ronald Reagan came up with. Is that if you make the rich rich, it'll trickle down to the poor. You know, mm. if you let me buy a BMW, I'll let you clean it. Um, you know. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. You can be my maid. Yes, and, and that that type of society, we did have that very structured society, and when you look at it um, in the medieval period. Um, you know, even what you wore was prescribed and what you can eat. There's a big joke in this country about the swan. Only only the queen can eat swans. But that's a residual thing. It was the only the queen could eat swans. Right. Uh, and, you know, the old Robin Hood thing about shooting deer in the king's wood, shooting deer full stop. <laughs> All the deer, everything owns, the king owns everything. So if you kill one of the deer, you're killing one of the king's deer, full stop. So even what you could eat, what you could wear, where you could go, you had to ask permission for things, right? So you may not have been a slave, but you lived in a society that was high, heavily regulated for which the church provided the, the justification, the moral framework, and again, the social care as well, because uh, you can look at it, well, they looked after all the, uh, the, the excess of young men that there was, or they took away all the intellectuals, keep them out of the way. <laughs> the clever people will get them out of the way, stick them in the church where they can't cause trouble. Um, so there's very you can look at it on two different levels. My favorite example of this is I used to live in a village and we have prevailing westerly winds. And somebody built a big windbreak of big, tall trees down the side of the village. And everyone said, well, that's really nice. They've built a windbreak to protect the village. Uh, the people in the big house told me we built the windbreak so we didn't have to look at the village. So, <laughs> so it served it served as a windbreak, right? Perfectly well, but it also served as a as a way that their their view wasn't interrupted by the poor people's houses. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah, so well, things have two you know two meanings. <laughs> they, well, you know, in, both in, things are true. In yeah. California, there was even in a sense more reasons than that. Is also that you put up the high cement wall that random bullets don't go into the freeway, <laughs> which is sad. Also, yeah. another yeah. like, why do we have to have like that? Yeah. Wow. Well, it's again, it's a very different society in America, um, which is if I could say I've tried saying this to you before and I didn't get away with it. It's very much conditioned by fear, right? Because yeah. you're always you're, you're sort of scared of getting ill because you have no health service we're talking about. So you're scared oh, yeah. of losing your job. You're scared of your neighbor because he might be a nutter or he might have a bigger gun than you, right? Uh, you're scared of the black people or the, you're scared of the Latinos and the white people are scared of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many things to be afraid of, which in our country we don't have, or in Western Europe, because we have a health service. I, I never have to worry about getting ill, right? It's not, you know, it's not going to cost me, most it's going to cost me is a fiver for a prescription. You know, I have to go and buy some drugs. Um, uh, yeah, with me, I never know. Like one time we went, like in three years, it's changed like three times. Mm. It starts off, it was like, you said $5, then it was $10. My wife said now it's $15. Yeah. Well, it goes like, up. Three I think years, it's and it's already changed, you know, three yeah. times. Well, it, it's, it's about 80 quid. I don't have to pay for mine because I'm incredibly poor. But I got a, I got a new bracelet today. <laughs> the, the hospital gave me a new bracelet. <laughs> Uh, I've got a collection of them. Yeah. Mm. That's not <laughs> but, fun. Yeah, but that 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 but in a sense that makes you Americans, I mean uh we do not have quite so evangelical atheists as yourselves. If you know what well, I mean. Well, just so people know, it, it, I it, first off, yeah. I'm not just so people understand. I am not an evangelical atheist. I'm an activist. 
Yeah, I, 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 same thing. I yeah, should yeah, say. Yeah. And I did it because I was raised in a Christian cult where yeah. I didn't even have an education. And I was abused so profusely that I was in seventh grade before I could read a clock. <laughs> and here I'm freaking brilliant and I'm and I can't even function at school. I got F's and everything. Yeah, I'm getting beaten at home with the freaking two by four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting starved. I mean, so my, my point in saying is it's because of this cult. So yeah. my my attitude is is not is not like oh, because I people like I hate gods or something. I don't hate gods more than other atheists or something. It, I hate people who have used gods as a justification to fucking terrorize their children. Yeah. I well, we that. have the point is that we have less of that over here, in a sense, in that yeah. there isn't that need, in that. Um, but see, in we America, have, we have laws that say that they, when you do child abuse, if it's for religious reasons, you probably can get away with it, which a lot, not every state does, but some do. And not yeah. I mean, most, you would think reasonable countries would not go child abuse, child abuse. Oh, is it religion? <laughs> okay. Not child abuse. What the well, hell? That, Come on. Well, that's the complexity of your society as well. In the sense you have a state level legislator and what, uh, federal law can be very different from local law, and uh, it's inherently perhaps more corrupt than ours um, in, in some respects. I don't know. Um, ours, well, is more ours is more traditionally yeah, corrupt. About statism, it's <laughs> always corrupt, so just assume, yeah, there's no, yeah. like, ours is a traditionally there's corrupt, a good we ones, just accept you know? it. Maybe some uh, good people working in everything else is shit, but yeah. But the, the point is that... The, 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 there are so many good people in religion as well. That's the, that's the, the difficulty you have. There's good people and there's bad people. There's good people that are atheists. Just to clarify, like you said, yeah, yeah. Religion, oh, yeah. Uh, there is bad people that are atheists that I fucking I blocked a famous <laughs> atheist. You know, just yeah. yesterday, no, two days ago, that I had kept talking to me, but I felt that the issue was more important to. And it says, I, I could have easily challenged this person. I, I, but that's actually not always what I want to do because what I realize is sometimes when we demand respect, demand a certain way of relating, and we hold to this, it automatically, without even doing anything, without even saying what to do, the situation improves. And this is I learned I, I learned this in counseling. It's 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 really about being. But see, parents do good parents in a sense do this all the time. They hold to a standard, and the child knows that is the standard. It's not a like, crazy thing well, I'm I talking see, about. And and good people. This goes by the same thing. When you say good people, do you never have a standard? Uh, when you when you say this, do you never think uh, that there could be a standard? No, I, I could. Right. I, Most I don't people they say this, they have a standard. <laughs> I don't know. But they'll immediately say, but I don't know morality. <laughs> really? Then you don't have any standards. Because you said you don't know morality. Then how could you have a standard of what is good? I'm an, I'm an axiologist. It's all about how you value things. And I don't know how you get to say you are valuing something and yet have no standard you understand. This is not, to me, logical. Something no. is incorrect. Or I'm not, you need to explain it better or more. Because yeah. that <laughs> does not compute to me. Well, that's, we're into the difference between subjective and objective. And, well, well, to me, and, I, and I don't say, think, to me, there's only objective. Yeah. Um, I, de I demand. And subjective is, to me, going back to, like, in logic and reason, the only time it should be subjective is that, that before I know, I understand, I must gather evidence. That's a subjective, yeah. but yet a valid yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, when it comes to sort of religious experience, we're talking about the experience of your own consciousness, um, which is very personal. But I can relate to your ideas about, because I was dyslexic, I went to a boarding school, and dyslexia didn't exist when I was at school. <laughs> and I was just naughty and cheeky. And my parents took me out of school to send me to an educational psychologist yeah. to find out if I was educationally subnormal. I think they were disappointed to discover I was... I was okay. Um, but I had the record for being physically assaulted at school. Mm. <laughs> um, my parents didn't physically assault me. They paid someone else to do it, which is different. Um, 
Well, that's a, uh, a you know, semi to an institution. Not, they not, did it for not them. better, maybe more horrible. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, my father was a good man. I mean, he, he would be horrified at the thought of it, really. But he he was brought up in the same system. I mean, he was probably beaten at school. Um, and you can see the effect of, say, boarding schools, which is a, a big phenomenon in this country, uh, on our, arist our all our aristocrats uh, and all our leading, you know, rich people go to boarding schools from the age of, sometimes the age of seven, right? They're living away from home, right? And they're cut off literally behind a wall from common humanity. Hmm. And uh, it creates a certain a certain type of person and uh, they're very characteristic of our of our ruling class and they have a bit of a problem relating to people often because they're just being particularly girls if you've lived in an all-male society you have a problem relating to girls because they become something strange and alien and, and romantic right rather than something practical you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis on the school bus um and so that affects our society in a way, just the well, way I mean, our aristocrats just think as you said uh, had to deal with. Remind me of the school bus. I remember when I was picking on this kid. Right, <laughs> I was in I was I was in welding school. So this is after I was um, out of high school, but I was still I think I was like twenty two, and I, I'm um, talking about the effect of women. So there's only one woman that was in our thing. This uh, Native American um, uh, woman uh, who was doing welding too. Right. But she was she was tough. I liked her. Actually, everyone did. She was she was, everyone treated her like like all like all the same. Anyways, but this one guy came and he was really small and skinny, and I started making fun of him. I called him Cinderella, and I said he didn't belong here. You can't even pick up the torch. You can't even pick up the metal to do the work. I said the chicken pick up what you can't even do what the chicken do. Anyways, I and I, and I rode him, and on the bus one day, the woman goes, "I'm sick of it." Stop that shit. The only one that has a problem with it is you, and it's because you're a fucking idiot. And she started just giving me I was, and I didn't say anything. I realized I was wrong. Mm. Yeah. Well, so, uh, I'm just saying, so <laughs> sometimes getting an experience, like you said, outside, it, it can be the greatest thing in the world because it actually was it for the rest of my life that that one time someone called me out so freaking hard <laughs> in front of everybody yeah well really it's it's it, about how because it was really unjust there was no yeah. just i was being a, this person is is still trying and even after i bullied him for like two weeks still trying and who am i to be doing that how tough are they to keep all this up you know what i mean so it just changed my whole look that i was yeah. wrong and I, I tell everybody that all the time. I, I post a, a thing that says, you know, be open always and be teachable. That's the it. One you thing never I've learned is that to always be willing to learn. You never know what somebody's going to teach you, if you know what I mean. That's that's sure. the thing. And uh, I learned when I was doing my training, when I, when I was training people to do software, I was learning from them all the time. Uh, you know, what do they know? What, how, you know? And improving my technique and uh you know as i say i've driven taxis i've done all sorts of things and i've always talked to the people in my taxis to find out what they know <laughs> what's it you know. i i think that's wise because i think that, that, that this thinking that we can only learn from one type of mind or like yeah. people that they only learn from people that they've gone to college or only people that have degrees or only people that you know uh, um say have done one type of thing I really think it's it's great to hear a lot of opinions, and yeah. I don't. That doesn't mean all opinions are equal. I'm mm -hmm. saying listen to the quality opinions. Yeah, I, I, I listen to professionals. Uh, I, I, I'm very lucky. I've worked on a sheep farm, right? <laughs> and if you've worked as a farmer and got up at six o'clock every morning uh, for lambing for you know eight weeks continuously <laughs> and done all that you get an understanding of how farming works and what the farming routine is and how you look after animals and how all that shit works, right? Which a lot of people have no idea, not the slightest idea. Right. It's the same with what's holding the roof up. You know, never, most people don't think about that. I look at that constantly when I'm out there. And as an archaeologist, I, every time I see a hole in the ground, I'm thinking, 
Why is there a hole in the ground there? What's the arch? You know, when you see a gateway, you see the mess around a gateway. Right. You get two posts and a great hole in the ground with stones in it where the gate is in a field. That's it. When I see the ruts left by a JCB digger, um, I think I must measure those because I bet they'll turn up on archaeology sites every so often. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> wow. You get these strange parallel features and you go, that's a JCB. <laughs> that's compressed the ground when you cleared the site. Well, we're going to um, go ahead and close it. So um, could you go ahead and tell us uh, um, anything you want to tell us about you and promote uh, any any website or book or whatever you want to? I haven't got anything to promote. I don't really promote oh, well. myself. I'm terrible at promoting myself. That's half the problem. I've come to the acceptance that my stuff will not be accepted while I'm alive. Right? Because I've been blackballed hey, I've by the university. I've often felt the same. <laughs> yeah. But the, the, the thing is that, um, I, I, you know, I went to do a PhD and they threw me out because my stuff's not about what they call post-processional archaeology. They wanted me to write about how people feel about living in buildings, mm. right, in the Iron Age. That's how people we've never met perceive buildings that we've never seen. And as far as I'm concerned, that is just, you know, you should be sectioned if you think you know what that is. Right? <laughs> and it's also an abuse of the word cosmology. Right. <laughs> so because um, uh, Iron Age building cosmology is actually a tautology, which is a much more interesting word. Um, so I've got a site called Theoretical Structural Archaeology, um, which you're welcome to come visit. It's been there for 10 or 12 years now. There's over 50,000 words on it, lots of articles. And you can actually see the development of my ideas on there. My, my earlier articles full of things that I've got wrong. Uh, I never bother correcting them. I just say, this is my latest ideas on this. And you can see the development of the ideas. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, Jeff Carter at Structural, something like that. Um, and if you just Google Jeff Carter and archaeology, there was a time you could Google Jeff and archaeology. It'd be at the top of the list there. And... Anybody wants to know how Stonehenge was built as a building, it's welcome to contact me. Um, but i am uh, been quite ill recently, which has mm. made me oh, a, yeah. bit, a, a bit more. I've had, I've still got cancer. And I've had, I've lost a, I've lost a kidney to landfill, and um, so I'm a bit more radical than I used to be. Uh, I just accepted that, you know, my life was over. <laughs> <laughs> and that because the university would not accept me and because it's like being the Freemasons. Once you get blackballed, nobody, you know, right. it's one right. out, all out and they won't touch me. Um, and yeah, there are it, people there who know that my stuff's all right uh, in particular areas. They're quite enthusiastic about it, but they can't do anything about it. The professor said to me, I wish I could help you, Jeff, but I don't want to be stabbed in the back by the people who stabbed you in the back <laughs> because I have my career to think about. And I'm saying, you've just told me you work with a bunch of criminals. <laughs> if I was paying for my PhD. And next thing I know, I was thrown out for not doing any work. Well, I had done the work. It's just the work I'd done was about engineering <laughs> and not about how people perceive buildings, um, which, as far as I'm concerned, is not something that I have access to. Um, but so that's me. Um, and I'll keep knocking it out there. I have well, a lot of well, I appreciate you sites. coming on and, and talking with us and uh, and. It's been a, a great conversation. And Corey, could you go ahead and uh, tell us about your stuff? Sure. I didn't contribute much to this, but yeah, yeah. Uh, hello, Corey. It's nice it to meet you. <laughs> it was a good listening. <laughs> well, how, how about that? Why don't I you want to talk to you about six. Tell us, tell us I you you about know, anything you learned today or you thought was interesting or yeah, I, I'm good to hear it. Well, I mean, uh, I've worked in uh, like construction and I, I grew up on a farm and stuff. So I, a lot of this structural engineering stuff, I kind of, I have a, a, I find it interesting, even though it's not my current career, right? So it's, right. it's neat to learn about some of how it's uh, developed over in the past. And especially the stuff where like how the, the buildings had to be kind of twisted. <laughs> like I find that really interesting, but uh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the secret that the offset tie is my greatest discovery because that explains everything. If you, if you can, once you've got that concept in your head, you can do anything. Also, I would have loved to talk to you about Sitka spruce. Go ahead. Because uh, a Canadian tree that, that <laughs> dominates my landscape up here. We live, a, we have the largest man-made forest in Europe, and it's mostly Sitka, uh -huh. which is which is Canadian tree. And the reason it's Sitka is that's the best material to make airframes out of. Hmm. And in the 1930s, they thought airframes were going to be made out of wood. Mm. 
<laughs> so we live in the largest Sitka plantation outside Canada. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Anyway. All right, but I tell us about your uh, um, show, and then we'll uh, we'll end it. About sure. Uh, anyone who's listened already knows it's uh, the mind of a skeptical leftist. Uh, the podcast is on Anchor.fm, and uh, I'm on YouTube, and my Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty. Right on. All right. Thank you. Well, and thank you very day. much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Yes. And anytime you. you want me on again, I'll be more than happy. Thank right you very on. much. For your, thank you very much for your time. Yes. Cheers. See ya. Bye. I hope, in the simplest terms, I am an atheist humanist philosopher and prehistorical writer researcher at DamienMarieAdhope.com. I am specifically an axiological atheist. An axiological atheism can be thought to involve ethical and value theory reasoned and moral argument driven apathyism, agnosticism, atheism, anti-theism, anti-religionism, secularism, and humanism. Axiological atheists can be understood as a value theory or a value science atheist. As an axiological atheism's ethically reasoned and constructive pro-humanity, I am an axiological thinker, value theorist. The science of goodness, worthiness, usefulness, valuableness, Virtue, reliableness, accuracy, validity, morality, integrity, beneficialness, etc., etc. We axiologists have a value consciousness. And in general, we see the architecture of humanistic humanitarianism value in people that we see as dignity beings. Places and things are not. Axiology is a value theory. In its broadest sense, it involves areas of philosophy that are deemed to encompass some evaluative or evaluation aspect. Therefore, it crosses almost all domains in some way or another. Now for a more detailed terms as to what I am. I am an axiological atheist, an anti-theist, an anti-religionist, secularist, humanist, rationalist, writer, artist, poet, philosopher, advocate, activist, with schooling in psychology, sociology, as well as I am an autodidact, self-taught in science, archaeology, anthropology, and philosophy. I promote science. And I'm against pseudoscience, pseudo-history, pseudo-morality, things that are found in religion. I support realism, axiology, of course, liberty, justice, ethics. I am also an anarchist socialist. I support anarchism and socialism, progressivism, liberalism, philosophy, psychology, archaeology, and anthropology, advocating for sexual, gender, child, secular, LBGTQIA+, race, class rights, and equality. So if you can guess from all that, I support or challenge that I have an eclectic variety of videos on a variety of topics. Please take time to check them out, as well as enjoy, if you enjoy them, please give them a like. And don't forget to subscribe as new things are on their way all the time for my channel.